Thanks, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished professors, dear students, uh, and all uh, colleagues, welcome on the seminar with topic Industry 4.0. Sorry for my external uh, memory, but this is the standard in, 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 uh, in uh, Industry 4.0, and for sure I, 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 I have to use external memory. My name is Tomasz Tomas Kmielewski. Uh, I am a Dean of Faculty of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering of Warsaw University of Technology. And this is my great honor to welcome you on our, our meeting. The, the seminar is the part of uh, work package of wide project Industry 4.0 in production and aeronautical engineering, which was fully funded by Polish National Agency for Academic Exchange. And the chief director of the agency, Dr. Grażyna Żebrowska, I hope is today with us, but maybe she will be late. And uh, we, we appreciate the, um, the financing and I assume that the, um, the fruits uh, will be bring in a few years. Uh, the seminar is realized under patronage of the rector of our university and many thanks for, for looking after us. Uh, rector Zaremba will be, will be late. Uh, she confirmed the, um, the, um, a few minutes of, of late. And uh, the project Industry 4.0 in production and aeronautical engineering is being realized in partnership of two faculties of Warsaw University of Technology. Our variable partner is Faculty of Power and Aeronautical Engineering. Let me to welcome the Dean of Faculty of Power and Aeronautical Engineering, Professor Janusz Fronczek. Thank you, Professor, for, for, for being here. Uh, let me to welcome the deans of other faculties of the Warsaw University of Technology. Um, are also with with us uh, the professor Professor Piotr Przybyłowicz, the dean of Faculty of, of Automation and Construction Machinery Engineering. Uh, our neighbor neighbor faculty um, of mechatronics is rep represented by Vice Dean, Professor Olga Iwasińska-Kowalska. Welcome. And Professor uh, Jarosław Domański, the Dean of Faculty of Management. Thank you. Thank you for, for being here. And I would like to thank each of our, of our speakers for taking part in this even, event. Thank you very much for your time, commitment, and the opportunity to listen to you in, in person. I especially welcome the invited speakers and thank for acceptation of our invitation. The quality of, and achievement caliber of keynote speakers are outstanding. And let me welcome, uh, let me to welcome the keynote speakers in appearance. Order, and the first one is uh, Professor Lucas da Silva. <laughs> professor of, full professor of Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Faculty of Engineering of the University of Porto. Head of the Advanced Joining Processes Department and Director of the Mechanical Engineering Bachelor and Master Program at the University. Thank you for, for for being here, for being with us. And by the way, I would like to, to say about Professor Achievements, mm. his index here, his age index is 26% higher than his age. Its uh, result is 62 of this simple equation. Uh, the second uh, keynote speaker is Professor Marco Marci, full professor in Politecnico the Milano. <laughs> Currently teaching industrial uh, technologies, assets, uh, life cycle management and smart manufacturing lab at Politecnico di Milano. Also acting as director of the master program 
by the Politecnico di, di Milano. He is the chair of the IFIC Technical Committee, Manufacturing Plant Control, associate editor of Journal of Intelligence Manufacturing, editorial board member of the International Journal of Production, Planning and Control. Very welcome. The, 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 another mm, keynote speaker is Professor Rodolfo Haber, but uh, he will be here in a few minutes. And Professor Francesco de Lisola, University uh, All'Aquila, Italy. Very welcome, Professor. <laughs> Director of the International Research Cent Center of Mathematics and Mechanics of Complex Systems. Mm. H, in the, uh, H index 62. My congratulations. And uh, last, not at least, uh, the keynote speaker, Dr. Thomas Rupert, University of Pannonia. <laughs> Specialist in research area, computer science, industry, data mining, industry 4.0, process optimization and process simulation. So, dear audience at the room, thank you for your participation. And online participants, I also want to thank all of you for connecting this morning and I hope you are looking uh, forward for the discussion as much as I am. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Krzysztof Eismont, who is the supervisor who is the supervisor of the project and chairman of this of sessions of our our seminar and the, the floor is yours <clears throat> thank you very much uh, dean Chmielewski. Uh, welcome everyone i am very glad that you are today here with us uh, i am a little nervous because first time i can welcome so distinguished guests so please forgive me if i make some mistakes but really, I am honored and pleasure that you are here with, with me, with uh, our dean and, of course, our faculty. Uh, as dean said, I have a great pleasure to be a project coordinator of, of uh, IPA project. So this symposium is a part of this project, and we can say that we have only uh, two months to finish this project. So this is, I think, a good opportunity to summarize our efforts, uh, our works uh, in this project, because uh, it already was started in 2018, so uh, more than three and a half years uh, ago. So, so it's uh, a lot of time. So we have made, uh, I think, very, very big achievements during this period. Uh, of course, uh, our faculty, as Dean said, is a coordinator of this project, but without second faculty, it will be not possible to achieve so benefits. So I also want to welcome Professor Robert Gombotsky, which is also the coordinator of this project. Uh, so, thank you very much for your support and big efforts, of course, to, to especially aeronautical part of, of uh, this project because we connect two disciplines. But I must admit that during this project we uh, established cooperation with many, many partners. Uh, so, Faculty of Management, so it's a very, very uh, big uh, pleasure to work with you because many uh, sciences from this faculty supported me to achieve the, the results of the project. So thank you very much for uh, Dean uh, Professor Kusieracka, uh, Dean Eric Godzinski, and many other uh, sciences from this faculty. Uh, so as you see, we established cooperation not only inside in these two faculties, but in the whole uh, was University of Technology. So it showed that, uh, of course, we can we can do this together and, of course, make uh, very good research achievements. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I hope that these two days will be very valuable for you. Uh, I am glad that you are here in our, of course, place in this room, but also uh, people who are watching us on the online. I also uh, suppose that you should be uh, enjoy of, of this uh, event. Uh, Maybe I just uh, said a few words about the, the, the aim of this project, what we achieved uh, during this. Uh, so, the, 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 in 2018, the Industry 4.0 was very, very popular. Nowadays, also, is of course, still a very popular term, but now we heard about Industry 5.0, so uh, we still, of course, uh, accelerating the progress in the scientific fields. But in 2018, when we prepared the proposal, so, uh, 
uh, industry for zero was the, the, the keyword almost in every scientific uh, journal and, and uh, papers. Uh, so of course, uh, we want during this project established working on uh, many fields in industry for zero. On the beginning, uh, basically on the production engineering of those aeronautical area and fields. But uh, as I told you, during this project, we also established cooperation in uh, many other uh, disciplines, so of course this is, I think, also a very positive aspect of the project. Uh, and I think the benefits of this project can be uh, useful in uh, many, many areas, not only these dedicated on the, on the aeronautical and production uh, engineering. Um, in this project, uh, we involved basically 10 universities uh, when we prepared the proposal. So, as you see, we have uh, very, very famous and prestigious universities. Uh, so, we are, of course, the coordinator. So, was the University of Technology, but uh, without uh, our foraging uh, distinguished partners, it will not be possible to, of course, achieve so many great achievements. So, we have uh, University of Applied Science and Arts of Southern Switzerland, so SUPSI. We have uh, University of Politecnica di Madrid, so CSIC Center. Uh, we have Politecnica di Milano, so as you see, some guests, some distinguished guest keynote speakers are from this uh, university, so it's a great pleasure. And also we have many others university that we of course established cooperation. But what is the, I think, most important uh, for me as a project coordinator is that during this project we established cooperation with many, many other partners. Yes? So we established cooperation, for example, with University of Southern Denmark, uh, Komsat University Islamabad, so from Pakistan, uh, University of Pannonia, and many other universities. So, so I mean that during uh, these more than 3.5 years, uh, we wrote many, many scientific papers, we established many proposals of the grants and research grants. So I mean that this uh, project, uh, I think, even uh, extend our expectations of, of, uh, of um, achievements. Uh, and what, what, uh, what is the, the most uh, important and the main objectives of uh, this project? So, first of all, uh, we want, of course, obtaining other research grants, especially uh, this from European Union level. So, uh, we achieved this goal, so we, uh, we have a new project based on this IPA project, so we prepared the proposal. So, Dr. Strzelczak was the, the godfather of, of this project uh, from uh, site of our faculty, so we, we have now TIT for SME project, this is Horizon 2020 project that our faculty uh, also uh, participating, so this is based on the IPA uh, project uh, core, so it's, uh, I think, great achievements, and of course we also submitting many other uh, research proposals, but unfortunately uh, they are declined, but uh, of course it's not easy to, to get funding in the European level, but we're still preparing uh, new grants and uh, our guest, Thomas Rupert, uh, a few days ago submitted the proposal, so I hope that, uh, of course, we also maybe achieved a uh, positive result in this field. Uh, also, the, the, the next um, aim was the publication of articles in the prestigious journals and conference papers, uh, and this uh, goal was realized in a really I, I never expected that we can, of course, publish so many papers in a very prestigious uh, publishers and journals. So, for example, Elsevier, uh, so Dean Chmielewski also prepared the papers in a very uh, big scientific conference, it's international. So, I mean that in, uh, this, in this point, we published more than uh, 20 papers in uh, very, very good journals with high impact factor. Uh, so this is also, I think, confirmed that this project uh, meets our expectations and even extend them. And, uh, of course, uh, the last but not least point was organization of uh, international scientific conference. Uh, of course, uh, we can say that also we realize this because this symposium is international. We have many distinguished guests from, from uh, abroad. Uh, so, as you see, we realized all of these three main um, goals that we described in the proposal. Uh, so, this event is, uh, I think, good occasion to in the one side, listen about Industry for Zero progress because we have experts in many fields. Uh, so, so we can, of course, make discussion and summarize our efforts. And I think this is also a very good occasion to establish new cooperations, prepare new uh, proposals, and of course, I hope working uh, with many faculties together and achieve, of course, much, much more than we did in this project.
So uh, thank you very much for attention. Uh, I'm really sorry if I talk too much. This is uh, when I am nervous. Uh, and I hope that you will spend two wonderful days with many, many high quality presentations. And of course, uh, I will have a great pleasure to also uh, be with you in this whole event. Uh, and thank you very much once more for attendance and uh, I wish you a great event. So thank you very much. Uh, okay, and some uh, information, additional information. So the coffee break and lunches will be in room 341. So this is two floors uh, upstairs from, from here. So of course I can also show you the way, but uh, I think it will be not a problem. And uh, one more thing that in this event we have also uh, industry. So we have also enterprises which showed some very good technical advancements. So I mean that we won't connect science and of course industries because without this cooperation is very hard to exist nowadays so i think the, the science and industry should be uh, work uh, together uh, and on the end because i forgot uh, thanks of course for the all organizing committee so without you it uh, will not possible of course to organize such events so i know how many work you did in the last two months, so it's, I really appreciated this. I think Dean Milewski, of course, also. So uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for Eva Bernadette, for Eva Kowodziejuk, for Michał Baranowski, Krzysztof Krzysztofiak, Miroslav Neyman, Jacek Kozlowski, Bartolomi Gladysz. Uh, so it was a great pleasure to work with you to organize in this scientific and uh, industry event. So thank you very much from here. And I really, really appreciated that uh, you did so many good things. Okay, thank you very much and I wish you a great event uh, and I think uh, we are perfectly on time, so for a moment the first uh, speaker will of course present the presentation. Uh, so I don't know that Dean Chmielewski won't uh, say maybe something or we can start. Okay, so the first keynote speaker, as uh, Dean Chmielewski said, with uh, incredible uh, big achievements in uh, science. Uh, we'll start uh, our symposium, so uh, Lucas da Silva from Porto, so uh, please. Uh, okay. Uh, Can I use mine? Yes. Michal, mamy jakiś? Okay. Okay, because we have. Uh, uh, this is this, no. Uh, this is this presentation, I think, yes. This is okay, perfect. Okay. Speaker, it's not. It's not really. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, very good. So, first of all, I want to, um, to thank you for the invitation, for being here. It's a pleasure for me to be here. It's first time in Poland, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, congratulations for the great country that you have. Uh, years ago, you used to be well behind Portugal, and uh, but at the moment you are already you passed already Portugal. So, so congratulations. That's the first word. Second word is for Thomas. 
special thank for Thomas for inviting me to be here. Actually, I, I met Thomas in a conference. Um, that's especially a message for uh, the young people, the young researchers, engineers that think that uh, the important thing is to write papers and publish. That's important, but uh, it's also important to go out, to go to conferences and to meet people. That's where you meet or where you make your contacts. And that's what will have really a big impact in your uh, career. At least th that's how it worked for me. Uh, it's in the conference that I really made my network and I met important people and that my uh, career uh, took off. Okay, so that's for um, the first uh, words. Um, my, my field is uh, joining, L like Thomas, that's why I met Thomas in a conference, but he is more uh, welding and uh, I am more uh, adhesive bonding. You might wonder wh why, why this is relevant to Industry 4.0. Well, Industry 4.0, we could talk about basically anything, right? Um, it's about uh, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing and combined with, uh, with the digital world. So talking about uh, joining processes is also all right. I, if you don't have a, a advanced and an efficient uh, advanced joining, then you cannot have industry 4.0. So I think also it makes sense to talk about this subject. You are not um, probably very, very familiar with the subject. I don't know. I think there are people from many, many fields. So it doesn't make really sense that I go deep into the details. So I'll try to be superficial so that everybody can understand what I'm talking about. All right. I, I have uh, 150 slides, so I could talk all morning. Don't worry. I'm, th I'm sure you don't want that. So I, w I will limit my presentation to Maybe these, these first, these first uh, things, the rest I will, I will leave it for another occasion, another invitation from Thomas, maybe. Um, so, um, let's start then uh, with the motivation. What, what, do, we, um, what do we target uh, as a research group? Well, we want to uh, serve especially the um, uh, industry that uses structural joints, joints that are supposed to uh, withstand uh, high loads. And typically, uh, this is for the transport industry. So you have here in this figure uh, uh, examples of the transport industry. By, by the way, at the moment, you have a big revolution in the automotive uh, uh, car making, where welding, unfortunately, is being replaced by uh, adhesive bonding in many situations. Uh, th that's because they use lighter and lighter materials like uh, aluminum or composite materials. And the best way to join these materials is not welding, not spot welding, like traditionally made with the cars made of steel, but um, it's better joined using adhesive bonding, okay? When you put composite materials, when I, when I talk about composite materials, I talk about uh, resin reinforced with fibers. I'm sure you all know this from all the fields. And the best way to join these materials is with adhesive bonding. They are married. Every time you have composite materials, you also have adhesive bonding, all right? Um, but we also work in other fields, uh, electric, uh, components or packaging components, basically everything that has adhesive bonding, we are happy and we, we, we work with this industry. Um, I'm especially talking about adhesive bonding because this is uh, how it started the research group. 20 years ago, I did my PhD with um, Professor Bob Adams, which is like God in adhesive bonding from Bristol University. I don't know if you know. but. Uh, Nowadays, we also do research in other methods of joining. So the, the group expanded and we also do research in uh, joints uh, uh, formed by forming, by plastic deformation of the, of, the, of the sheets. And we also do welding. So we are a competitor of, of Tom as well nowadays. He doesn't mind, I'm sure. Um, let, let's, 
with the adhesive bonding and the challenges associated to this, um, to this technology. Um, the, the most common type of joint is this joint, the, the single up joint. Probably you don't understand really why, why you use a single up joint, why you don't use another type of joint. And to make sure you understand this point, I'm going to make a small demonstration. It's very quick and you will, it will be very, very clear why this type of joint is the most common type of joint. I'm going to talk very loud, you understand still? So I just brought a piece of tape with me so that you understand why the single up joint, why this joint is the most common type of joint. So, first of all, adhesives are plastic materials. So they are weak materials. For example, steel, if you go to mild steel, which is the, the weakest of the steels, it's about 150 MPa. If you go to high strength steel, maybe 1,500 MPa. If you go to a composite material in the direction of the fiber, 1,500 MPa. And I just said before, for these materials, adhesive is the best. For a, a, a material which is 1,500 megapascal, you use a material which is maybe 25 MPa. Does it make sense? Doesn't make sense apparently. But if you do things properly, it works. Bear with me. So tape, everybody knows this, right? How, how do you do to take off a piece of tape? You, you apply this kind of loading, right? And it's, it's peeling very, very easily. I'm doing absolutely no effort, right? Very easy. Now, if I use exactly the same material, the same substrate, the same adhesive, but in another way, you will see that I can produce a very strong joint by doing a single up joint. When I peel the adhesive, I concentrate all the load in a, in a line, basically. So the resistant area is very, very small. And because the adhesive is very weak, it fails, right? But now if I do a single up joint, so I'm, I'm going to put one a piece of, uh, of tape on top of the other. I don't put adhesive against adhesive. I'm not cheating, right? I'm putting the adhesive on the other part of the texture. And I do a single up joint. I do the joint that is most common. I just referred, right? This is a single up joint now, okay? Exactly in the figure. And I'm going to load it in a different way. Not peel anymore, but intention. If I put the, the joint like this in tension, the adhesive will be loaded in shear, right? And let's see how it fails now. But I'm doing a lot of load, believe me. I'm nearly fainting at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and it failed finally. And it didn't fail in the joint actually. It failed outside the joint. So the joint is not the weakest link anymore. So do you understand what you can do if you do things properly? So, single up joint, top joint, excellent. However, it doesn't mean that uh, this joint is perfect. You, you, um, you have problems even with this joint. Because you, you could think that the joint, the stress distribution is uniform along the overlap. But that's not true. When you load the joint, actually, the stress is concentrated here, at the ends of the overlap, okay? You, you can see that with this, you see, I brought this from Porto, especially for, for you. This is a rubber, hard rubber, and here is soft rubber. And I have lines here. I to pull it, just like I could pull it, the, the tape, and you will see that these parts of the joint are much more stressed than the middle part. The middle part basically is doing nothing. You are ready? I hope I will not fail again. Can you see? The, 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 the extremities are much more loaded than the middle. Maybe it's not totally clear, but that's what I want to say. Okay, so even, even this joint, you, you can improve. And initially the group, the research group of, of, of Porto, that's what we concentrated on, to uh, make the joint more efficient so that the whole overlap contributes to the load bearing. And there are many things you can do, many. They are explained here. You can play with the joint geometry at the ends of the overlap. 
you can play with the surface treatment, you can play with the modification of the adhesive properties, many things you can do. And we could uh, actually uh, invent, provide, uh, uh, discover many, many tricks to improve the joint strength good. That's, that's what uh, made us busy for about 10 years. But uh, that's solved, that's over now. At the moment, at the moment uh, what um, worries the community in this technology is not the efficiency of the joint for tomorrow. It's not the joint strength anymore. It's more, more than enough. What worries the, the, the community now is the durability. That's the key word. That's, that's why it's in bold here, you see, durability. That means I want to know what's the effect of water, what's the effect of temperature, what's the effect of fatigue, what's the effect of impact in 10, in 20 years. That's very, very difficult to predict. And that's what we are working on, basically. Us in Porto and all over the world. Basically, that's the major, um, the major uh, research field at the moment, okay? Um, I told you that we work on other methods of joining. So for the part on joining by forming, by plastic deformation, um, here I would say that the hot topic is um, dissimilar joining. If you want, for example, to join aluminum with steel or steel with a plastic, not easy. So we are working on this. And finally, welding. Um, we are working on the two technological processes that uh, offer a lot of hope to solve many problems, which are laser welding and friction steel welding. I'm sure some of you also that know very well what I'm talking about. So that's the challenges, that's the motivation in the group. All right? By the way, I asked the chairman to stop me when I reach the 30 minutes and shut me so that you can move to the next speaker, all right? Because I tend also when I'm uh, 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 excited to talk too much, okay? Okay, let's talk about the methodology. Again, this is something probably is common for all the research groups, but I think it's important to mention this, also important for Industry 4.0. So this is how we work in the group. The first step is to generate uh, fundamental knowledge, all right? Uh, fundamental science. Then, uh, when we generate that, so something that is new, it needs to be new, otherwise it doesn't make sense, right? Um, we try to disseminate as much as possible so that everybody knows what we are doing in papers, in, in uh, journals, conferences, books, etc. Then, um, we get visibility and then the companies, naturally, they come to us, ah, you have discovered this, you have found this, now we want to apply this in our products. So this is called the transfer of technology. And of course, we get a lot of money from that. Then this money is fed here so that we can generate again fundamental knowledge. So like this, we have a sustainable uh, group. Of course, on top of this, we have funding from the national body uh, of uh, uh, the... Portuguese Science Foundation and also the European Union also that fund uh, research projects. Um, about the, the way we work, for you to have an idea, uh, this is basically in general the flow. It's kind of pyramid. The first thing we do is to determine the material properties. And there are basically two types of tests we do that are represented here. We do strength tests. So we know, we know the strength of the material, the ductility, the stiffness, that kind of properties. But we also do fracture mechanics tests so that we get the fracture energy in, in tension, in shear, because increasingly adhesive joints are designed using a combination of uh, continuum mechanics and fracture mechanics, which is called damage mechanics. All right? And you need the properties from both if you want to be successful. So with these properties, we go to uh, simulation, finite element analysis. 
We try to reduce the number of tests as much as possible. Tests, experimental tests, are very, very expensive. So every time we can work in the computer, of course, we save money. So we go to the computer, we optimize the joint. When we are happy with the optimization, with the simulation, all theoretical analysis, then we need to go back to the lab, of course, and make sure that that we did theoretically in the finite element analysis actually is true, it works. And then we close the cycle and we are happy and we move on, all right? In general, that's how we work. Um, let me refer the team because it seems I'm the only one and I have a high H index, but it's only because you have a good team behind in general. This is fundamental, okay? So this is the team, a bit of everything, really. They are uh, ugly ones, handsome ones, clever ones, stupid ones, a bit of everything. The stupidest is this one, of course. The others are very bright, believe me, okay? Um, we, we work with also, of course, people that are located in Porto, but we have a, a network that goes from Japan to America. We work with everybody, basically. At distance, nowadays, you can work with anybody you want. Okay, that, that's the beauty also of, the, of these new uh, technologies. So you, you have examples of schools with whom we are currently working, all right? Um, these are uh, locations where all students are. And, and now I want to move to the, to the competences so that you have an idea of uh, what we can do, what we can offer. Uh, this, this symposium also, I think, is a good opportunity to, uh, to identify common interests and maybe find uh, future collaborations, all right? So this is our competences. Production, easy to understand. Uh, we, we need to produce good quality specimens for the lab, also real specimens if you want to have good uh, or the real mechanical properties, makes sense. Then we need to have competences in testing. You need to test properly apply the load properly so that it's similar to what you have in practice. Simulation, I told you, we do as much as possible to save money. Machine design, it's more difficult to understand why we also have competencies in machine design. Let me explain. Um, many times we have uh, special tests that we need to do. Special tests mean you need to uh, uh, buy special machines. Already, conventional machines are extremely expensive, like a, a universal testing machine. Maybe it's 100 kilo euro, it's a fortune. Um, but I want to do a special torsion test for adhesive joints. Uh, what is the quote from Instron, MTS, whatever? Ah, it's 200K. What? It's too much. We have money, but not that kind of money. So what do we do? We use our clever students to design machines, we buy the components, we mount the components, and then we have a, a machine that is maybe 5 or 10K, and in many situations work even better than the commercial machine. Clever or not? Very clever. So that's, that's the reason why we also have competences in machine design, all right? So these are examples of the equipment that we have. That's for manufacturing, nothing special. Uh, the special thing is that we are at completely independent group. Uh, you, would, you could think that, okay, when I have something to machine, I go to the workshop and I work with another lab. When I have something to test, I go to the testing lab and I work with another lab. We used to work like this, but then I need to wait sometimes one month, two months, three months from the workshop. Then I need to wait one month, two months, three months from the testing lab. And I don't like that. I like my students, when they feel to work at 2 o'clock in the morning, we never know, they can go to our lab and do their, their uh, piece. Or when they want to test something, they can test whenever they want, whenever they feel. I think that's a more, much more efficient lab. That's how we, we work. We, we can cover everything in the lab, from, from basic manufacturing to testing, simulation, everything. We do everything. So that's for the manufacturing, surface treatment. Adhesive bonding, um, it works only if you have a very good bond between the adhesive and the substrate. The, the way the substrate is treated 
is essential. That's the most difficult part of the production of adhesive bonding, the surface treatment. If you get it wrong, you are in trouble. It will fail here with a low load. The surface treatment exists so that the failure will take place here in the, in the adhesive. All right? So very, very important step. step. Molds to make sure that we have good quality specimens. That's for welding, testing, uh, special apparatus for testing. Uh, this is com laboratory components, real components. That's the machines we did, the students did. It's the students who, who did all this. So this is for creep, uh, drop weight, torsion. This one, I'm really proud of this one because this is totally new and we patented this. It's a new torsion machine. TG, I'm sure you know what is TG, the glass transition temperature of, of materials. It's a special machine. You only see this in Porto. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And this is a split Hopkinson bar apparatus, I'm sure you know also, for very high speed uh, impacts. Again, this is unique. The, the, way, the way the impact is applied is unique. So all these, it's the students who did that. Okay? Uh, simulation, we use Abacus in general, and we, we use the elements library, but we also develop new elements, especially for durability. I told you at the beginning, durability is the key issue. So we need to develop special elements that take into account water, that take into account fatigue, all these things. This does not exist in Abacus at the moment. Okay. Uh, we, we also designed a, a software for uh, designing adhesive joints. N nothing really new in that software. The, the, the beauty of the software is that anybody can design an adhesive joint. Even my wife, who has nothing to do with engineering, she can design an adhesive joint because it's so user-friendly that anybody can, can do the job. Okay? Even me can use this software, imagine. Um, and now, just a, a few research projects so that you have an idea of what we are currently doing, and then I shut up. So this is one that is currently going on. Um, I have quite some hope in this one. So the concept is, is here. A good figure is better than a thousand words, we say. So this is what is currently done, right? This is a car with metallic parts. That's what we want to do. So we want to substitute all these materials that are very difficult to recycle and bad for nature by this that is uh, nature-friendly, wood. But the wood is not really uh, to be trusted. When you say your car is made of wood, people probably will not go in the car, right? So we, we need to make sure that the wood is stronger. That's why we are using uh, densified wood that is much more dense and much more resistant. But then you have the problem of delamination. Do you remember the car I told you at the beginning, the BMW car, i3, made of composite, adhesively bonded? Uh, the king of adhesives is epoxy. And you think about, ah, I want a stronger adhesive. What is the strongest one? Uh, give me the epoxy. But it's not adhesively bonded with the epoxy adhesive, curiously, the car. It's bonded with a very weak adhesive, with a polyurethane. Why they use polyurethane? Why they don't use epoxy? German engineers they are not that stupid. They are clever, right? So if they use polyurethane, that's for a good reason. That's to avoid delamination. You understand what is delamination? The composites... Uh, in this direction, direction, when you pull in this direction, direction, fantastic. But when you apply this loading, you also peel the composite in, in here. And this will delaminate because in this direction, the composite has a very low strength. Basically, it's the strength of the resin. So it will fail by delamination. And if you use a stiff and strong adhesive like epoxy, you delaminate and low strength. If you use a flexible and ductile adhesive like polyurethane, it does not delaminate. And the whole adhesive can work. And then you have a high joint strength. So sometimes the strongest Adhesive does not give the strongest joint. Two different things, right? So, to avoid, avoid the lamination, what we do is that we put on top, top of the, the densified wood cork. It's a kind of surface toughening. We toughen the surface to avoid the lamination. Right? 
Um, this is a project we have, a European, a European project we have with the marine industry, where we work basically on composite joints. Again, delamination is a big issue. Uh, this is a nice one. This is a, a graded joint. Graded, another key word at the moment in the research is functionally graded material. It's a very sexy word. We, we also work on that kind of material. That's, that's the concept here described. So I told you at the beginning that when, when you load this, you have stress concentrations here. The idea in here is to create an adhesive which properties vary along the overlap so that the stress will go down at the ends of the overlap and you have a uniform stress distribution. How can you do this? You can do this but by non-uniformly adding particles so that you have a perfectly stress distribution in the adhesive along the overlap. Now the challenge, how do you non-uniformly introduce the particles? Not easy, because when you mix, it's uniformly distributed. How do you non-uniformly introduce the particles? What we did is that we used magnetic particles. We used cork, we covered with a magnetic uh, material, and then we applied a non-magnetic field. You can see the cork here moving. And then, with the non-magnetic field, we obtain a non-uniform distribution, uniform shear strength, and higher joint strength. That's the idea. Okay. Um, I think it's two minutes left. I don't know if you want me to stop, or, or, or I carry on. What do, you, what do you want? Please carry on. Okay. okay. So, th this is another project. Uh, actually, at the moment, you remember the slide that I said we transfer, we try to transfer as much to the industry. The, the industry that comes to us at the moment is one, basically one, it's the automotive industry. Precisely because of the revolution I talked about. The welding is being substituted by adhesive bonding. So they need uh, data about adhesive bonding. They don't have, they don't have enough data. Um, and one of the data they need is impact. How does the adhesive behave under impact conditions? In cars, impact is the key word. Aircraft or aeronautical industry, the key word is not really impact, fortunately. Right? The, 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 the design philosophy is more fatigue in aeronautical industry. But in car, in addition to fatigue, you have impact. So you need to device, you need to determine the adhesive properties under impact. So we have done a lot of work on that. But to determine the properties under impact conditions is a big, big challenge. So that, that was exactly the challenge of this project, to generate basic material properties under impact. So, so you see we need uh, specialized equipment, high-speed camera, to determine the displacement, the load from the displacement, the load, we get the fracture energy under impact. And then we can design under impact. That was the fundamental properties. Then we moved on to uh, real joints. Then we worked with Aston Martin and we, we worked on this joint, the front header. So we have the properties. Now we can determine or we can design a real joint now. So that's what we did. We did it, uh, well, that was supposed to have a beautiful movie. It's working here, but it's not working here. It doesn't matter. Th this is the front header under static conditions. And this is the front header under impact conditions. Ah, you have it now. Boom. So we use different kinds of adhesives and we found one that works uh, better than, than the others. And then we were, we were happy at the end. That, that's another one where we, we work on the toughening. I told you we can use cork, but we can use also uh, other methods. Uh, we, we have used a, a, a tough resin that we reinforce with some fibers. And we increase drastically the joint strength. We, we even patented this. At the moment, we are also using thin plies, which is, which is a kind of composite, but uh, much better than the typical prepreg, which is the material normally used to, to, to fabricate composite materials. Additive manufacturing, also it's hot topic in Industry 4.0. We use also in adhesive bonding. We use to make graded substrates I told you about graded adhesives. You can also do graded substrates. You can also do 
during the manufacturing process, you can put different materials and you can put one material that will melt and then you can also have a hybrid joint where you have adhesive bonding plus welding and then you get the good things from the two. You have synergetic effects at the end. And that's it. I think it's enough. I talked enough. Um, th sorry for the, for the abrupt ending. I had many, many more things to say, but I think you can get a good idea about the competences, the main research projects that we have at the moment. And uh, now I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lucas da Silva. It was a great pleasure. I, I was really inspiring about your presentation. I know that you have much more to say, but unfortunately we have also other speakers. But I am more than sure that during the coffee break and during this event, of course, we can talk together. Uh, but if we have one, two questions, of course, please feel free to ask our distinguished guests. We have some questions regarding this presentation or... I think the guests are too shy, like me, so, but thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation, and I am more than sure that during the debates we will continue and you can say much, much more about your researches. So thank you very much. So, uh, and the next presentation uh, will be dedicated uh, about the Tit for SME project, which was originally based on this IPA project. So this is the Horizon 2020 project that uh, our faculty uh, also participating, and this is our, I think, big success. And the uh, speaker is, of course, the project coordinator uh, in behalf of our faculty, uh, my friend, uh, Miroslav Neyman. So the floor is yours. Uh, and uh, I wish you, of course, good luck. Thank you very much. Uh, as Krzysiek said, uh, this is a chart of our project, uh, NAVA project, Kit for SME, because uh, we, during this project, uh, travel to our partners in many countries. Uh, We've write several publications, uh, several articles, we join some conferences and also work uh, to, to write some proposals to European Union. So this is the project uh, we won. So uh, I, I will show the project. Uh, on the beginning I will sell say some introduction concept of uh, the project uh, pilots installations about open calls and some conclusions on this slide you can see uh, our partners in the project uh, we have 18 partners from eight countries um, the main coordinator is in switzerland in lugano uh, on the map, you can see uh, several antennas. Uh, there are universities in these cities. Uh, blue points are uh, SMEs where we will install pilot uh, demonstrators. Uh, next color are uh, companies uh, which are uh, AI programmers uh, or DIHs, so institution will help to create the platform of it for SME. Um, the fund funding program uh, we want it is Horizon 2020 in topic I4MS. Uh, the total cost of this uh, project is over nine million euro. So is quite a big uh, project. On our faculty, uh, there is a se several person who joined the project. Uh, we are from two institutes, Institute of Manufacturing Technologies and Institute of Production System Organizations. Uh, Dr. Strzelczak uh, was the first manager of this project, uh, our mentor. Uh, 
Uh, now I am the project manager. Uh, in the next slide I will show the uh, promoting video that was created uh, in the project. Artificial intelligence is transforming not only our way of lives, but also the way we do things. Now, more than ever, manufacturers rely on artificial intelligence to streamline operations, launch new products, new customer acquisition, measure KPIs, and more. That requires shifting focus from the primary business to dealing with multiple digital solutions, which can result in fragmentation and lots of confusion. And, given the expensive infrastructure and data expertise it demands, it can become a daunting challenge for most manufacturing, small and medium enterprises. Kit for SME is a project supported by European Union to foster innovative artificial intelligence for smart manufacturing with four selected piloting environments. One important feature of Kit for SME is the two open calls, which are designed to benefit SMEs with the opportunities brought by a platform and artificial intelligence-based kits. The first open call addresses technology providers of AI components to enrich the platform offer. The objectives will be to validate the expandability of the kit for SME digital platforms, complement existing platform modules with added features and functionalities, attract potential SME solution providers to the project ecosystem, among others. Please be aware that details on the first and second open calls will be announced soon. Visit kit4sme.eu and follow kit for sme social media channels in Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook to learn more. Okay, it was very fast, so uh, um, maybe uh, some wider. Uh, what is the current situation? Uh, what we analyzed? Uh, when we prepare uh, the proposal. SMEs are unprepared and inadequately exposed to extremely complex and widely diverse digital solution in the field of artificial intelligence. Current solutions are too broad in scope and relentless in dictating their own objectives instead of focusing on the issues a company really faces. And next, big companies have capitals and resources to reach and build platforms internally. SMEs struggle in finding solutions to deploy AI-based solutions and kits that are fitting to their needs in smart manufacturing scenario. Current lack in the digitalization race for SMEs is, is not a system by product, it is a design and feature. So, lacking of reliable, robust and efficient kits for exploiting innovative AI in smart manufacturing to deal with SME's digitalization challenges. The goals of the project, uh, the, the, the main goals, uh, to make available to SME's ready to use customized digital packages for embracing artificial intelligence opportunities at affordable prices and proper scale. To seamlessly fuse artificial intelligence and human problem-solving expertise into a single digital brain with unprecedented uh, shop floor orchestration cap capabilities. To build a competence development center that advances Europe, European workforce in line with digital skills trends and workers' aspirations. To extend the offer of local ecosystems so that players with different uh, competences can thrive while collaborating in the creation of customizable artificial intelligence kits. And to support standardization in the fields of sovereign uh, data economy and the characterization of worker skills and training expertise. So, in, in short, we want also to create a platform with software and, uh, and other tools uh, to, to create uh, easy to take uh, 
kids for SMEs because they don't have money to, to develop their own um, R&D uh, internal uh, uh, internal forces. Uh, they need uh, to develop. Uh, they don't have money as big as companies uh, to, to develop. They, they need support in this area. area. So uh, our goal is to create this platform with, with uh, these tools. How we will do that? Uh, the first step is to diagnose. Uh, we created some questionnaires uh, to help diagnose what problems are in the company, what they want to improve, what they want, uh, uh, what, what type of KPI they, they want uh, make better. Uh, so, so we must diagnose uh, what machine choose, what type of job choose to, to diagnose and, and make better. Next step is Compose, uh, because there are not universal tools of artificial intelligence to use. We must Compose, sense uh, uh, what type of signals to measure, what type of KPIs to measure, uh, choose correct tools, uh, maybe some tuning will be needed, uh, and give the SME the tool that exactly they need. Next possible steps is interverf uh, because we can create uh, many scenarios. How uh, after anal data analysis, uh, what we can do? Uh, change some production, change uh, materials, uh, predict uh, tool failure. There is many scenarios how the uh, artificial intelligence can help uh, for the companies. Uh, so the platform will give a tool uh, how to interview with, with the data and, and to what uh, do better with artificial intelligence. Uh, the next step uh, is evolve. Uh, because uh, on the beginning we, we have four pilot installations uh, and we will demonstrate how the platform work with this four installation uh, but the, the platform will be open uh, for uh, new tools artificial intelligence intelligence tools um, the platform will be open for external companies uh, who will program another artificial intelligence tools uh, and platform will be marketplace when you, you can sell another artificial in intelligent tools and help SMEs or you can be another SME and you can buy some tools artificial intelligent tools so the platform must be uh, evolved uh, must be scalable be open for, for the new tools, for uh, new solutions. Uh, let me say uh, about the pilots, about the demonstration of our project. Uh, the demonstration will be in four different uh, areas. The first uh, is injection molding sector, next quality system sector, next uh, high precision hand tools and the last one uh, is uh, in electrical equipment sector uh, the first one uh, the pilot demonstration targets uh, in a work cell uh, that use 500 tons injection molding press uh, they are producing very heavy plastic components uh, and they need uh, to dynamically assigning 
task to operators and cobot or Cartesian robot. So dividing this this uh, task is the main job uh, for the platform, it for SME. Next demonstrator is in quality system sector. Uh, company DMAC produces uh, some machines. Uh, where kit for SME will help. AI-based kits will be applied to reduce the resources dedicated to assist customers' operators in system configuration and reduce potential human errors uh, due to non-optimal configuration of the acquisition infrastructure. And next SME is hand precision hand tool and instrument. Uh, it is ITEC from Croatia. Uh, they are um, producing uh, tweezers like in, in the picture. Uh, the last operation is manual. Uh, it, it is creating the uh, polishing uh, as a last uh, of the finishing operation. Uh, what they want? Uh, Dealing with both challenges by inter introducing AI-based quality control in the finishing step and by establishing a best practices process combining different data sources. They will be using uh, some vision methods. Also. Uh, the last pilot, uh, it is in Poland, a company near to Warsaw. Uh, they are manufacturing uh, batteries from the single cells. Uh, they are create, creating uh, battery sets like on the pictures. Uh, the small cells are connected uh, by welding points. Uh, and the uh, Kit for SME platform will help analyze the process of welding. Uh, will, will measure the current, uh, the state uh, of welding um, to, to, to help uh, make the good connections uh, of in the battery and uh, pre predict when the tool will fail. So uh, as you can see, the task for the platform for every pilot is very different. Open calls. Uh, for us, it is a big test for the platform because uh, the f there are two types of open calls in the project. First type, uh, we are just after it, uh, is addressed to technology providers to enrich the platform offer. Uh, uh, after open call, have I, I don't remember about ten uh, technology providers not connected with uh, our project, completely outside from the project. Uh, they are programming completely new uh, AI software for the platform, and this summer we will uh, set open calls for new SMEs. Uh, when we will introduce these uh, new AI tools to these SMEs uh, to verify how it works. Uh, the task uh, for open calls. Access to EU fundings uh, because we will, the project will pay for programming new tools. Uh, we will validate the products reach potential, potential customers, be part of a growing ecosystem of solution for the industry. And the task uh, for SMEs. Um, access to EU finding because we will pay uh, for the pilot installation in their companies. Integrate customized AI solution to current production. Find the solution developer. So we do matchmaking service. Uh, 
for every company who won't program AI tool, we have uh, 50,000 to 100,000 euro. This is type A open call. And for the SMEs, we have uh, 150,000 to 200,000 uh, euro uh, to implement uh, AI solution. So for us, it will be very interesting when we will test these solutions. Uh, so it will prove we are ready to create platform to support uh, SMEs. So I, I was very fast. So uh, I don't know if you do have any questions for the project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we have some questions, or we are still so shy to, to ask. Uh, if not, thank you very much, Mido. It is a great pleasure to work with you in this project. So, uh, thank you. And of course, if uh, somebody is interested more about details in this project, and of course, also maybe want to start and participate in open calls, of course, you are welcome, and I think uh, Miro or other uh, employees in this project can uh, help you. Uh, okay, and uh, the next presentation uh, will be from the industry, so it's a great pleasure. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, this will be the CEO of the uh, attend company. Uh, so I'm very glad that uh, the industries are also here because science is, of course, uh, science, so it's important. But without industries where we can verify our solutions, uh, it will be very hard, of course, to, to exist. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours here, so I'm glad that you are here. So Pavel Pisarczyk, so uh, please welcome, and of course, the floor is yours. Okay. So thank you very much for the possibility to make a presentation here. This is a great pleasure for me. And please forgive me some mistakes if they will be and if they will appear. So um, today I would like to tell a little bit about, about our company, about what we are doing. And uh, this is the main reason of the presentation. I don't know, I don't like to present this presentation like a marketing material, you know, to promote us, but rather I would like to go deep in details what we are doing and what cloud platforms or industry 4.0 means, in our opinion. So, uh, Attende Industries is a company which is a part of the Attende Capital Group. This is the spin-off of Attende Software Company. Many years ago, we decided to develop from scratch the technology for internet television, and we were very successful because all of the internet television in Poland worked on our technology, works on our technology, and we sold this part of this company two years ago. And current and the attend the industry is the industries is the part of the attend the software, and we are mainly focused on smart grid, intelligent robotics, and development of cloud platforms or industrial IoT. Uh, and currently we are developing two, com two platforms. The first one is named bsmart.energy. There is a domain in the internet. This is the company, this is the platform for managing the energy in energy communities, in microgrids, and even in the uh, regular customers. And bsmart Vision is a platform which is devoted to control the Cobot, cobots and robots and, and to make them smart. But today, Michal, my colleague Michal Sadowski will present this company together with our partner Van Technik in more detail, so I think that in this presentation I will focus on Bismart Energy. Uh, and why we are talking about uh, energy in terms of the Industry 4.0? Okay, so Industry 4.0 paradigm will give us a great flexibility in consuming the energy. So we believe that everything will be smooth and the manufacturing will go according to the energy uh, production. And the main and very important thing is to manage the energy 
to be efficient and optimal in terms of the producing the energy from the renewable sources. And current energy system, maybe not current, but still current, is centralized. So we have the power plants that are connected through the customers using the energy grid and is uh, mainly um, is mainly using the the fuel like coal gas oil and so on and so on yes so but we and this type of system is uh, unmanageable and is very difficult to maintain in the future so currently we observe the big revolution this big system will be transformed or is have being transformed into the federation of the microgrids and energy communities because of the popularization of the renewable energy sources, because of the uh, pro geopolitical problems and because of the Green Deal. So we have to abandon usage of the coal and gas and everything which, is, which, which was produced many millions of years and is located in the earth and we have to switch into the renewable energy which comes from the sun, from the thermonuclear uh, reactor named Sun, uh, and uh, we, sh we have to we have to do something with this. And uh, this is the future. And there is a lot of problems in implementing this because we have a big oligopoles, monopoles in the regular energy sector. But we have to do this if you would like to be, if you would like to not to be dependent on the countries like Russia and other, which which uh, support, for example, terrorism. Uh, and uh, current energy sector landscape, what we see. Okay, so we see the increasing the price, that the prices of energy are still increasing because of the emissions fees, because of the cost of the fuel, and so on and so on. We observe that we have technology which allow us to massively implement the renewable sources. So the photovoltaics and inverters are now cheap, so we have the ability to install the there's a, there's a sources, but the big problem is that we have to do something to manage the sources, to control the sources, because we have to have st stable energy source rather than unstable uh, energy grid. And this is the m biggest challenge for companies like Atende Industries. Uh, we see that we can have in the future the power outages and the, 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 there appear the real risk of blackout. But what is very promising that we are now dealing with the energy storage technology. So we have the lithium ion magazine storage, we we promoting now green hydrogen, we are using this. So this is the big hope for the future, but everything which was mentioned here demands a technology and demands a software to control everything. Uh, and Technology is almost ready. So, as I said, that we have a cost-effective technology for transforming the energy from the renewable sources into the 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 the, uh, the variable uh, voltage systems. We have the now massively implemented smart meters. The smart meters are not so smart as as we believed before, but we are doing everything to transform them into the smart devices, and we have. Now we observe the big popularization of the manageable energy receivers, like heat pumps, which are manageable because we can program the heat pump in which periods they have to, such pumps have to produce energy. And we observe now the massive deployment, maybe not now, maybe not massive, but the beginning of the implementation of 5G networks, because 5G networks allow us to control the devices in the real time, because they have the predictable jitter and they can be used to control the, uh, the, the, the stuff connected to the, to the network, to the grid. And now in the, we observe the, 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 the implementation of the cloud-based energy management system. This is very interesting that BP, that big producer of the regular products related to oil and gas spent money to buy the open energy company which develops the cloud platform for managing the energy in the household to promote the to max to optimize the usage and uh, of of uh, renewable sources and we are developing B smart energy platform as well okay and what B smart energy is so 10 years ago together with energa operator we 
started or maybe we were involved in the biggest implementation of the smart metering in this part of Europe. So we developed from scratch the software named RedGrid, which gathered the data from the smart meters installed in Energa. And we learned a lot about this technology. We learned a lot how the meters should look like, how they should be constructed. We innovate the meters, but uh, this is the, the, the responsibility of the, uh, our another company named Pink Systems. But the size of this system, and we learned how to deal with the big amount of data. We learned that, for example, relational databases are not good to process big data, um, how to say, they are, they are not enough, than sufficient to process the big amount of data, unstructured data stamped by the time. And that was the beginning of our interest in the smart energy sector. And we decided to develop the platform named Be Smart Energy which will be based on our own database named T-Storage. This dat database is no SQL database, but well prepared to store the large amounts of data. This is something like, you know, Microsoft Cosmos DB or maybe Amazon Timestream. We spent a lot of money and time and effort to develop from scratch this database. But idea of this platform is very simple. So we would like to have a cloud platform which will gather the data from the meter, which will predict the next, uh, next period of time, how energy consumption production will look like and try to do everything to balance this energy locally, to maximize the local consumption. And this is pretty in line with the new regulation related to uh, energy communities. Because the, as I said before, as I mentioned before, the future energy system will be, uh, we, 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 we look like the federation of the small systems and the systems required to have the platform which will allow to control everything, yes? And currently we are involved in two or three implementations of the system in Poland, in small or maybe larger cities, and we would like to develop the system and to preserve the energy autonomy in the and as a, and as a, and as a, uh, cities. Uh, and uh, how the system looks like. For example, this we, 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 we have the ability and we know and we are able to gather the data in the real time. So for example, this chart represents the voltage sampled each minute. So we observe very interesting uh, things, phenomenon related to, for example, energy production. So we have everything and we, using the machine learning, we are able to predict what will happen, what will happen individually with each customer, with the whole community. We need this because if we know this, we can do something, for example, to splash the energy consumption curve or maybe to promote the usage of the, uh, of the energy sources renewable energy sources. And this system is able even to predict the prices on the stock market, so because in some cases we have to buy something from outside. Uh, we have, we developed, maybe we customize or develop because we, we hire uh, some mathematicians and geophysicists to, to develop our own weather forecast model, which will be uh, which will allow us to predict the weather in high resolution because it's very important to predict how the, for example, insulation will look like in the small, in, in the small part, maybe in the small area because we, having this, we can very strictly predict and correctly predict the future. So we have this in the system. Uh, so we are using, you know, the HPC cluster based on 200 processors interconnected with InfiniBand, all Fortran codes and so on and so on, but we have this and we calculate weather uh, each 15 minutes, each uh, five minutes, yes? So, okay, uh, and what is very important in this platform, because as I said, that we are involved too in the, uh, in the disruption of the methods, how the meters should look like, the methods of constructing the meters. So, together with Apator, this is the, one of the biggest uh, meter vendors in Europe. We developed from scratch the meter, which is developed like the regular computer. So it is based on our own operating system named Phoenix RTS and allows to run the user application on this meter, on this operating system. So this is a very disruptive idea because meter is connected with the cloud and is able to install the user applications to control, for example, the the equipment installed in the household. So this is the similar idea which, which we observed 10 years ago, 20 years ago uh, in mobile phones. So we prepare the meter which has price 
very similar to the price of the regular meter, but the software is constructed in this way that we are able to install everything what they want, what we want and what they want in, in terms of the user. So even we can develop here the application in Python language and, for example, to analyze what is connected based on the samples gathered from the uh, uh, from the from the uh, from the analog to digital uh, uh, converter sampling the voltage and current yes uh, so for example this is our meter but named this is the prototype meter installed in Ochotnica in Poland and here you have the console of Phoenix RTOS and the software is structurized so on the very small microcontroller you have the the same feeling like with regular computer and you are able to install what you want. So you, you have here the TCP IP, USB and everything what is, what is required. So this is, so what we are doing, we, are, we transform the meter into the Edge IoT device which is able to do everything what we want and which is well prepared to be installed in the future smart grid system because the most important thing, in our opinion, based on our experience, is to uh, to gather the many signals, but in the real time. Because if we know everything in the real time, we are we know how everything will behave in the next periods. If we gather the data, for example, from the last day, it's such data are absolutely mm, makes no sense for us because they they uh, they don't allow us to to do what we want. So this is, and on the government level, we are pushing strongly on grid companies to promote the idea of gathering the data, energy data, uh, in the real time, because this is very, very important. Okay, so this is what Bsmart Energy is. It's based on our own database. This is the platform for controlling the energy. We believe that it will be successful because the idea is to sell this as the service uh, and which allow the, 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 the communities to be autonomous. Uh, so this is, this is the method of, of implementing this, uh, this the technology. And as I said, but Michał will go more into details in the, in, the, in the next presentation. So having the experience in AI, having the experience in gathering the data, storing the data, uh, developing the distributed storage, we decided to develop the platform for intelligent robotics. So, Bsmart Vision is the platform which gives robot perception of the unpredicted environment. So, it's based heavily on the deep learning and this is very similar to what Vicarious is uh, doing and No Magic AI. So, we analyze the environment and we give the robot possibility to recognize the, uh, recognize the um, how to say, uh, rec recognize the specific shapes and to to perform the uh, task which demands the, the, the such type of rec uh, recognition. Yes, so uh, how it works, okay, I have to launch this, maybe Michal will show. So we have the cloud and based on the camera connected to the cloud, we recognize the recognize the equipment, the materials in some manufacturing process and generate the custom stream for controlling the robots. So this is, we, we allow robot to, 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 to perceive, the, perceive the reality, but in, how to say, undeterministic way. Maybe, maybe predi to, to perceive the unpredicted uh, reality. Yes, okay. And as I said, I think that I have the, because five minutes, so maybe I will, go depth into details how, what this storage is. Okay, so as I said, regular database systems, relational database systems are not well prepared to storing the large amount of data sets, especially data sets coming from manufacturing process, from the reality. The most important data type used in energy and in other tasks is the stream with timestamp data. And we decided to develop from scratch database which will allow us to very smoothly process the data streams, but timestamp data streams. Uh, we developed this database na named T-Storage, the same thing did uh, Amazon with uh, TimeStream and Microsoft with Cosmos DB. And uh, currently we have more, 
more records than 7 billion records in this database. We have about 1 million, uh, 1 thousand of uh, billion records. I don't know how to, what is, how it's pronounced in English. Uh, so we have thousand billions of records inside, but uh, so the, our motivation was that there is no, that there were no existing no SQL database in open source domain. Uh, we learned a lot how we have to store the data effectively based on our experience in AMI in Energa. And as I said before, we were very experienced in terms of multimedia because we developed the biggest storage, which at the end, when we sold this company, has the capacity about eight petabytes. So we were involved in development of the object file systems and we decided to develop this new database. And the idea of this is very simple. So we have the U storage node named universal, U means universal. So there are the storage nodes interconnected uh, using the specific graph topology, but it's not so important now. And we have our own distributed logic system time, which is necessary to preserve the time consistency of this system. And data is spread across the nodes and the, this split uh, algorithm based on the ranges of the five element keys. So for example, we have the range which defines the, for example, domains, meters, meter objects, acquisition times, this is the time when data is stored in the system, and capture times. So we have the ranges, and based on these ranges, we can precisely locate the data on the specific node in the system. So this is very similar idea to, for example, DynamoDB, but for spreading, they are using the key value algorithm. But for, in our solution, we are using the ranges, and this is pretty in line with the processing data in Industry 4.0, because usually we would like to have to get, usually the, 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 the typical use case is that we gather the, some part of the signal to process the signal, and after this, we write something to the database. So this is the idea behind the t-storage. So we are using ranges to spread the data and using this five element vector to localize and to, 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 to search this, this data set. And the more details, I have the publications, papers, everything, but because this is the typical scientific work, we hire here about four, five uh, scientists, uh, but uh, currently we are even we are developing this together with some companies from the European Union because of this IPCI CIS project. And this is the basis of our, of our solution. Because having fast, quick, reliable database, we can do everything what, the, what we want. For example, the images from the cameras uh, using to control the robots are stored in this database as well. So this is what we are what we are doing, and this is what I try to mention. But if you are interested in go into the details, so we can provide you the papers, materials, and everything what you want to learn. Okay, and now conclusions. So there are some truths. <laughs> okay, there are some well-known statements. Okay, but what is very important, uh, in my opinion, we know that big data, the data in Industry 4.0 acts like a fuel for processing, for these systems, yes? Uh, now, everything, everyone is trying to establish Cloud Edge IoT continuum to support the migration of the application between the edge and the cloud. So this, this is what we did with this meter. So we allow programmers to launch easily software directly on the far edge to process the data to smoothly cooperate with the cloud. So this is what is now under development and under discussion on the level of the many bodies and European bodies and so on and so on. But what is the, maybe not the holy grail, but the real challenge, real challenge for the implementation of the industry 4.0 is still big data, are still big data repositories because we have to have the method of storing the data effectively in terms of the performance cost, reliability, and so on and so on. This is the reason why Microsoft spent money for Cosmos DB1, why Amazon spent money for Timestream, why we are doing something in this with this storage. And real data, real-time data acquisition is still the challenge. Because uh, if we gather the real data, 
maybe if we gather the data in the real time, if we are talking, for example, in energy, we are able to observe not many problems and many, how to say, vulnerabilities of this system. Because observing the voltage in the very precise, with the very precise revolution, allow us to very quickly show that, okay, this transformer is, should be changed, this transformer is insufficient, it should be implemented in the another place. So this is the challenging task, but from the point of view, not only technical point of view, but business as well. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we have some questions because the presentation was incredibly interesting and I think it's a very good to have a, a presenter of the industry, so CEO of the company, which connect and based on the, some scientific, of course, uh, researchers, but also implement on the practice and as we can see, it was really impressive. And this is the future, I think, of the energy. So maybe we have some one or two questions uh, for our specific guest. Please don't be shy. Every question is welcome. So, yes, I know that it will be coffee break. So I think everyone want to go to the coffee. Uh, so if we really don't have, okay, we have one question from Professor Maki. Very nice. It, it is more a general question. Thank you for your presentation, which is uh, which was really uh, interesting to me uh, because it takes a general sense of this transformation we are living in these days uh, in digitalization. I'm more from the point of view of production and maintenance activities, but of course I understand the, the perspective of energy as well. Uh, my question is basically more general. I mean, uh, we are, uh, in my understanding, the digital transformation is bringing uh, exactly to this uh, specific decentralization of data management and data analytics, uh, which is not... Uh, I mean, in the first year, probably was not the same understanding. I mean, it was more talking about cloud computing, but now we're talking about moving to edge computing, which is a potential. How, my question, you, you very well explained the technical matters, I'm not entering in this, but more in, in a question of your, of your transformation as a company. Uh, you were bringing this uh, uh, focus on edge computing and uh, uh, I would say uh, the understanding of, of the importance of edge computing uh, at the beginning uh, could not be uh, so, let's say, clear. I mean, and how you release it, that this path, this roadmap of transformation from cloud to edge services, that's the point. Thank you very much for this question because uh, I mentioned this uh, when I, when I spoke about Phoenix RTOS. So simultaneously, I'm, C, I'm CEO of Attende Industries and Phoenix Systems. And Phoenix Systems is the company which is developing the operating system for far edge devices, for IoT, which allow to transform the devices into the computers able to run the user applications. And what is important now, the European Union perceived our operating system as the European standard candidate because in China Huawei is trying to develop Harmon OS, we know this system, Google is trying to do it with Fuxia and currently we are pushing on this Phoenix RTS project based on IPCI cloud infrastructure and services. We are the after matchmaking. We have about 16 industry partners like Siemens, Deal and so on and so on because IoT devices shouldn't be more simple sensors with some ability to to, to, to put the data to the cloud. They should be able to process the signals directly in the devices. Good example is, for example, a good example is meter, which is which which has the possibility to, for example, detect what type of devices are now uh, switched on because we would like to learn more. This is the not intrusive appliance load monitoring because we would like to know as the user what we have now run in our household. For example, we, we, we would like to uh, perform such tasks like we would like to detect when user uh, power his electric vehicle and we can do this smoothly using the edge processing because 
analyzing the Fourier shapes, Fourier, uh, Fourier transforms of the signals, we can detect based on AI, for example, okay, this signal now, this is the mix of the lamps and, for example, uh, loading signal of the electric vehicle. Yes, so we, I believe that we, we should have in the future cloud edge IoT continuum because cloud processing is not sufficient, not enough, and we are doing this and we are playing with this uh, using our Phoenix systems company and Phoenix RTOS and this open source project, so I invite you to please visit the GitHub and we have the million implementation of the system in smart gas meter in Belgium. So this is the most important thing, I think, so in Fluvius. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So, Marco, are you uh, happy with this answer or? Yes, okay, thanks. So, do we have some other questions to our distinguished guest or we won't drink coffee? Okay, so uh, now we have 15 minutes break, so we start uh, 20 to 12, and of course the presentation will be very, very nice because Professor Marco Matti will be talking about digital twins in operational management, so of course please welcome and uh, please go to this uh, uh, presentation. Now we have coffee, so my friend uh, Jacek will uh, show the, the room. It's on the third floor, so we can go upstairs two floors, and we have the coffee, tea, we have some uh, bakes, so... Please, of course, welcome. Do you have We gotta find a
<clears throat> okay, uh, so welcome after the break. Uh, we have a short delay, but I think it will be not a problem at all. So, of course, uh, uh, I want to inform that in online uh, transmission we have more than 100 uh, visitors. So, so, I think the most people choose just the online uh, version of this symposium, but of course, it's great. Um, now, I have a great pleasure. Uh, to host our next keynote speaker, so Professor uh, Marco Macchi from Politecnica di Milano. Uh, I am also very proud because we have cooperated in many years, so uh, this is also the professor in our faculty, so has a maintenance management subject in the GPM studies, so uh, some students from GPM, I recognize you, so I think you know Marco Macchi from, from the lectures and the first tutorials on maintenance. Management. So um, this is, uh, of course, the full professor from Polimi, and the presentation will be very, very interesting and, of course, very up to date. So digital twins in the operations management. So uh, it's very nice to uh, visit Marco you in Warsaw face to face after the COVID pandemic because this is the first visit after this long period. So nice to see you, and of course, I give you the floor. So thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me without the mic? Ah, okay, okay, okay. So I will use the microphone because of the transmission. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to contribute to, to this event. I would like to thank Professor Chemlievsky, if it's uh, correct uh, my, my pronunciation. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I would like to remember and thank uh, Professor Stretzrak, uh, who has been uh, starting uh, with this platform. And so the event comes uh, at the end. Uh, Thanks to him and thanks to Christa Zegismond for developing the whole thing. So I'm bringing here some consideration about digital twins for operations management, research challenges and opportunities. I've not prepared the 100 pages, but I would have been doing like this. I tried to sh shorten a little bit my, my consideration and reflections, bringing in the, an outline which is discussing uh, as a general introduction, cyber physical systems and the role of digital twins uh, therein. But the major part will be about understanding and applying uh, digital twins uh, in manufacturing operations. And at the end, I tried to uh, make some conclusions, uh, at least uh, considering uh, the understanding I have today about digital twins. Uh, let me say, first of all, uh, a very brief note on the fact that cyber physical systems uh, is a well known term that comes with Industry 4.0. I tried to develop some synthesis, uh, according to my understanding, uh, about the fact that cyber physical integration is a relevant matter to enable smart factories in the future. Then, uh, cyber physical integration may be intended uh, in different ways. Uh, I would say that two ways are about the computer based systems, uh, they are more integrated with the physical assets, uh, or at the same time, uh, the fact that the cyber physical integration, we can embed uh, advanced automation, including uh, new manufacturing technologies like additive manufacturing or uh, new advanced solutions like collaborative robotics. And at the end of the day, uh, what I will uh, consider in my speech uh, is more related to the decision making uh, and to the fact that this is changing, uh, uh, at least uh, is evolving uh, with data driven management of the operations. Uh, we had uh, a very interesting. Uh, presentation uh, just before the break exactly about this fact. We're distributing uh, computing capabilities uh, in an architecture which enables data-driven uh, information and then, then decision-making. The cyber physical system are re regarding, uh, 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 in my understanding, and I'm using also a definition from Professor Monostori uh, from Staki, uh, and cyber physical system regard uh, the presence of computational entities uh, which are closely related uh, to the physical processes uh, with their own automation. But they are bringing uh, a novelty in terms of computational capability beside uh, the normal way. Uh, as you see on the uh, left hand side, uh, we have the typical hierarchy from ERP to field uh, or vice versa if you start from bottom. And uh, the other uh, part uh, looks at the hierarchy with some revolved uh, perspective, uh, as uh, the cyber physical system may bring uh, more capability to be horizontal in the integration rather than vertical. So this is just to bring some flavor 
of the possibility we may have uh, with services uh, on the side of the normal hierarchy. I will be using this uh, reasoning later on, so it's just a background. On another side of the coin is about the cyber part or virtual part uh, of the cyber physical system, which is one part uh, where I see the virtualization. And virtualization means uh, having uh, one or more digital twins of the physical systems. And so in that part, uh, we may see that now we're having uh, uh, digital twins uh, that are uh, providing the virtualization characteristic of cyber physical systems. So if I move ahead in my presentation, uh, let me say that the first part was a brief outline just to remember about some definition of cyber physical system. Uh, let me just summarize about the fact that cyber physical system, to my understanding, uh, is a new capability that comes uh, evolving uh, the original computer integrated manufacturing paradigm we had in the past, uh, bringing more horizontal integration beside the vertical one. And at the end, the horizontal integration can have uh, virtualization as a characteristic which can play during uh, the operations. So now I will start from this uh, reasoning uh, to be more detailed and so I was preparing uh, two sections which are, let me say, my contribution of the presentation of today. The first one, understanding, uh, brings some consideration on the main elements of digital twins, uh, as far as I understand, and somehow on some consideration the way you design and manage such a kind of things. Of course, I'm not detailed in design and management of digital twins, but I'm giving you the ingredients for the recipe, in my understanding. On the other side, uh, we will see the application, and I will bring you two few, few cases uh, to reason on. I have a video, I will not show this video as a whole, it's not scientific, uh, uh, let's say, uh, video, but it's a movie. You may recognize uh, this is uh, as a movie from the Apollo uh, program uh, with uh, Tom Hanks. And therein uh, you see that people are working uh, uh, not on the digital side, but on a physical side. But it's not the real system, it's a physical twin. Because, uh, you know, the story, they had a problem uh, in the space, uh, which is the physical space, uh, and they were trying to reproduce a model of the real problem, the real physical system, so to communicate with them and to solve and, at the end, uh, secure their own life, to be back to Earth. So, I'm using this uh, movie to initiate normally with my students saying, uh, what is a twin? It's something which may help the real physical life. Then in this case, it's a physical twin, built in the JPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But at the end of the day, this is the idea, that you have a twin that works in parallel to the physical real entity. And this is the picture that uh, at the end uh, synthesizes some elements of the digital twin. In this case, I'm answering the question, where is a digital twin? Let me say, the digital twin is on the virtual space. It's not the real one. The real one is working with its own capabilities. If it's an automated system, it has a VLC. It has all the matters related to automation of production system. If it's a human, of course, it has its own brain, first of all. Second, it has some smart devices to connect in the IoT in general. And so at the end of the day, you're having the physical space which may be made by humans and machines that are bringing some data to the virtual space. And the database here established as one single database, but we understood also from the presentation before that we may have an architecture of data from the edge to the cloud, so it's not unique. But at the end, the, the idea is that you have an important capability which is about data management, which brings them to the data elaboration with the model they're building, and at the end we're having the digital twin. So data and model are relevant for the digital twin understanding, the digital twin can be understood also from the point of view of what you can do with the digital twin. You can do diagnostics, forecasting, visualization, and so on, but it's a meta that I will bring also in the application. In the theory of digital twin, a first theoretical background, which to me is relevant, is the understanding of digital twins on the way it works with the real life. So, this picture comes from a presentation, from a paper from Kritzinger and others. And it tells you a different understanding of the digital twin from the digital model, which is just not online with the real physical system. 
and the digital shadow and digital twin, which uh, have some automation of the flows uh, from the physical to the digital space and vice versa. Uh, this brings, uh, of course, the idea of a closed loop, but the closed loop may be automated only, in this definition, from physical object to digital object, and manually done uh, in the vice versa. This is the case of digital shadow. Or, or we have the closed loop in automatic way, we are talking about digital twin. I would say, my interpretation, that sometimes uh, this is a little bit fuzzy, the definition. If I have a human in the loop that decides and enables to close the loop, and of course we have automated procedure to close the loop, is that a digital shadow or a digital twin? That's a question I would not answer at the moment. But it's just to say that there is some theory about the automatic flows from physical object to digital twin. There is another theory that I like on the part of digital models, uh, which is taken by this uh, conceptual paper, which is my recommendation. It's from a researcher in UK. It's very conceptual, but I uh, found it very interesting to bring some reflection in this. He's using this term, runtime modeling and performability prediction. The runtime models enables, starting from data, some prediction of some characteristics of the physical system. In this case, it's talking about dependability. But at the end of the day, characteristic may be throughput, throughputability, reliability, and so on. So it's something which enables us to know how the system, real system, is behaving now and in the future. And it's important that we know, starting from the state of the actual system, and we develop a prediction for the future, maybe in the short term, maybe in the long term, but we have, and this is the definition from digital twins, a synchronization with the field. Otherwise, it's not a digital twin, it's just a digital model aside offline from the system. So the idea is that you're developing runtime models which synchronize with the state of the system and uh, enables prediction for the future. In the short term, in the mid term, it depends on the decision level you're having. Uh, my uh, specific research field in the past uh, was about simulation. And so I was interpreting, in my understanding, that a runtime model is a simulation model that works uh, online with the real system. And that was my interpretation that is well aligned uh, with this uh, picture from Rosen, which discusses about the digital twin concept as a simulation, uh, which is enabling uh, seamless assistance along the entire life cycle. And in particular, with direct linkage to operation data, which in my understanding is about, in operations, about field synchronization. We're synchronized with a field, with a physical object. And so we're not doing a simulation offline, we're doing a simulation online, where online, it depends on the decision you're having, and it depends on the way you synchronize with the system, the real system. That's my understanding. But let me say, this is my consideration as a runtime model, but I, I'm not only saying that this is the only runtime model, but I will be back later in the application. I'm anticipating here, I'm back to the same paper I was suggesting from Flamini, is now introducing another concept. These runtime models can run at different levels uh, in an architecture. You see the, the levels that are mentioned in this conceptual architecture, which talks about cyber physical system at a cloud level and so digital twins therein, cyber physical system at the fog level, fog computing level, and digital tw and so digital twins, and cyber physical system at the edge computing level, and so digital twins therein. The fact that we create an architecture with different levels means that we may have different digital twins running at a different level depending on the needs. So where a digital twin is located, uh, there may be a reason behind that. And there is a trade-off when you're deciding the location among a number of parameters. Let me say just a simple ex example. If you need a, a timeliness uh, uh, reaction uh, uh, from the digital twin as a suggestion, probably you may need some autonomy in the local side, so on edge. But then there are other reasons to bring uh, on top, on the cloud. So there are some trade-off where you can work on, so to decide whether the digital twins uh, is working. I let you another example for decentralization, so when we're going to the cloud level. If I need to know uh, a remaining useful life 
of different uh, assets that are working uh, in different uh, contexts, working conditions, uh, it's good to have uh, a knowledge accumulation uh, on the central level, not on only on the local level. And so this global knowledge, uh, of course, uh, requires some digital twin at the cloud level, at the cloud computing level. So at the end, it was just some few reasonings to say that when we're developing an architecture, we have to think about some trade-offs uh, to decide where to locate the digital twins. And back to the runtime models, this may be different depending also on this choice. Uh, I have an experience uh, where we applied the digital twins uh, using uh, machine learning as a runtime model locally to the single machine and discrete event simulation, so I'm back to the simulation paradigm, globally for the whole production system. And so this gives you the idea that the runtime models may be changing depending also on the level. Last uh, concern about the development of digital twins is about the fact that uh, digital twins refers to physical objects. As physical objects are built in the beginning of the life, uh, and then we go until the end of the life, uh, so uh, we uh, have a dismission of the physical object, uh, we can build the same digital twins uh, which are the counterpart of the physical object since the beginning of life. It's difficult and it's challenging to think uh, building uh, the digital twin uh, to serve uh, different needs along the life cycle. Because you start from the beginning, uh, you may think about uh, the different decision-making needs along the life cycle, which is uh, a disruptive approach. Because uh, 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 in my understanding, uh, when I was using, for example, simulation, this was offline, this was done for configuration or reconfiguration once for the life, and then I'm rebuilding the model if I need another configuration. Uh, the change is different. There is a paradigmatic change. You have to build digital models that may be used along the life cycle for different reasons. Of course, uh, this brings also to some consideration, you know, the, the different uh, perspective uh, uh, we, you may have uh, depending on the decision maker. And so for, probably you may have uh, different disciplines and different perspective of the digital twins we are developing. But, the life cycle model, the life cycle uh, perspective of the digital twins uh, is, uh, to me, uh, a recommendation to consider so to manage the digital twins along the life cycle. So, just to summarize uh, uh, what I said until now, digital twins is the, in the uh, digital space or virtual space. Digital twins has, have to be synchronized with the real life, uh, the real physical object as this was done in the movie from Apollo. Digital twins uh, may have different kinds of synchronization, depending, of course, on the decision you may have. Not necessarily we need the, uh, a detailed synchronization sometimes if we need a specific decision through the digital twins. And then I was discussing about also the fact that runtime models, which enable us to build digital twins, may be of different nature, simulation, machine learning. So this may be some models that are inside the application. Uh, our uh, specific statement of digital twins uh, regards not a product, regards a production system. And so my perspective is on the operations of the production system and on the fact that we are having uh, some capability in the mathematical models, uh, like simulation models, but also like machine learning models, algorithms, which may take advantage of the real-time data streams to be elaborated and be able, thanks to this elaboration, to have an online simulation. That's our consideration of digital twins. And so probably this is influenced for my next consideration in the speech. Here I'm reporting, uh, and so I'm entering in the operations management. Here I'm reporting uh, a number of ideas uh, uh, that are structured considering different uh, levels uh, in the production planning and control. So planning, scheduling and control are the three typical levels of operation management in PPC, production planning and control. There you see some statement, I'm not commenting them, but saying that we are finding uh, new applications uh, with digital twins emerging concept uh, within that new, those new applications for, let's say, a smart production planning and control of manufacturing. One relevant matter about these applications that probably is common to the all is that we are uh, reacting to what is happening in the field, which is a natural consequence of the definition of digital twins as uh, 
A digital model that is field synchronized, so synchronized with the field. So reacting to the field enables uh, is, an, is uh, an achievement that can be enabled by digital twins. Hmm? So uh, at the end of the day, uh, we are uh, considering uh, this uh, capability in the shop floor. I'm smiling because I, see, I saw some friends of mine entering in the room. <laughs> Sorry for these, uh, these deviations. <laughs> I'm keeping his attention as he has arrived now. <laughs> because we arrived at the top of the, of the presentation, so it's uh, good timing. Uh, here, I'm considering the very focus I wanted to bring in terms of application. Digital twins can be brought into the shop floor management. Uh, this is a picture that comes from Professor Tao from Beiyang University, well cited in this topic. It tells you, let's say, some concept which we agree uh, from Politecnico di Milano. We see that the virtual shop floor is something which has to be interconnected with a number of other sources, uh, which are the physical shop floor. So remember the initial picture, people with their own smart devices, uh, automated systems, so humans and machines, are in the physical shop floor, while the virtual shop floor is uh, reproducing uh, some methods in that kind, uh, which helps, uh, think about the, de the definition from Flamini, helps in pre performance predictability, pre prediction of performances, through these runtime models. But it's important also to connect to the information system we may have in the company, which exist and have their own data. And so, for Tao, there is a central role of the data management uh, between the different three, three uh, spaces, let me say. The physical, the virtual, and the shop floor service system. Uh, we are implementing with another picture, but I see in a similar way. Uh, we are, I'm using uh, the, the concept of computer integrated manufacturing in different hierarchies uh, from ERP to PLC. And I'm placing on the side uh, to establish horizontal integration a digital twin with the number, you see there, production scheduling, health monitoring, and so on, with a number of possible applications. And of course, there is a loop uh, between them because uh, we have to be field synchronized with the physical equipment. The main idea here is just to say that we're having digital twins that can be developed to have uh, some capability on the side of the original hierarchy we are having uh, from the traditional approach, which is uh, placing ERP, then MES, then SCADA, and so on. Which is still valid, but we are enlarging in our perspective some capabilities. So, using this scheme, we believe that decisions may be enabled by digital twins that are running in parallel with the normal procedures in the systems we're having in the company. And so, in that sense, once we have field synchronized, we can introduce some services, uh, which can be optimization of production scheduling, which can be health monitoring and prediction, and so on and so forth, uh, through the digital twin acting as a main uh, role to interconnect the old things. Uh, I have two simple examples. One, case one, is at the very bottom level. People that are doing their job, uh, just uh, not manual job, it's an automated line, but it has some supervisor, which is the human operator, and which is doing some uh, uh, physical task, of course, in that. And we, introduce it, we are introducing some role of the digital twin to help uh, to react quickly to disturbances. Mm -hmm. So the digital twin is basically a simple one. Probably it's more a digital shadow, but we're integrating uh, the uh, advices of this digital shadow uh, toward the operator so that the operator is making uh, the job quickly reacting quickly to some problems. Uh, here you see the demonstration in our lab. It's a flexible manufacturing line. You see the layout, uh, no matter about the details. Uh, in this, uh, you have a, a kind of cellular phone that is being assembled through a number of stations and the robotic cell. And we've built the uh, digital twin, you see in MATLAB and Simulink. And the digital twin is uh, field synchronized with uh, some uh, utility that enables uh, to have uh, here an instant synchronization. So the state here is exactly what is happening in each single operation. Uh, the scheme uh, is quite complex, but at the end, uh, if you see on the uh, left-hand side, uh, you see that 
the scheme is telling about uh, an integration of the digital twin with a mess, uh, which uh, uh, actuates uh, a quick workflow so that people are informed about errors uh, that may happen in the floor, in the flexible manufacturing line. Uh, to give you just uh, an impression, uh, basically the digital twin is uh, enabling uh, to activate some intelligence which recognizes the errors and the errors then bring to some solution. So the operator is informed about the errors in a quicker way. Here you see, just to have a simple example, that one error in the drilling machine of the, of the lab, of the flexible manufacturing line, is solved in about two seconds, rather than instead of 14 seconds without the digital twin. So this means a quick reaction because of a simple capability to have some minor intelligence to recognize errors, to help people to do their job in their supervision. So it's a digital, is it that a digital shadow or a digital twin? Hmm? That's, that's the matter of theoretical discussion we may have in concept. This is much more evolved. So it's much more complex also to explain. But at the end, the idea is very simple. If we have a, a, a virtual twin, a digital twin of the whole line, of the whole production line, and we know also the health, so if a, a machine is healthy or unhealthy or is in a given state of healthiness, we may have some idea of the risk we have for a failure, We're not having a failure. We have the healthiness level of the machine. So if we integrated these two words, we can make uh, probably some optimization of uh, our production scheduling decisions. And so in that sense, we are going up a level on production scheduling. We basically developed this uh, with a discrete event simulation model, which is reproducing uh, the line behavior, and a model which is making a prediction of the behavior of the single equipment uh, with its own healthiness. Okay? And the two models are different. One is discrete event simulation, the other may be a data-driven model for advanced analytics that comes from statistics, from machine learning. The main idea, again, you have a picture now of the a whole picture of the flexible manufacturing line of our, our same lab. You see some details, one, two, and three, on the real photo. And you, you have an impression of the fact that we are reproducing exactly these stages in the digital twin model. It's just an extra. The picture is telling you a framework which basically connects, uh, you see the optimization model on the left hand side, connects an optimization model based on genetic algorithm with, uh, see the right hand side, a simulation model, and the simulation model is connected with the field. So we are in the definition of digital twins. A simulation model that runs connected with the field. To better understand the idea, there is a simple picture with some, let's say, uh, good images, uh, which tells you uh, in action the story. Each single asset starts from the top left side. Each single asset has real-time data and historical data. And there you can do some prediction for the healthiness of each single asset. It can be done it's with statistic, statistical model, we applied this in this case, or with machine learning algorithms. It depends on the case. But we're doing something which enables to estimate the probability of failure based on the healthiness level we're reaching from this prediction. This is already a runtime model which is local to the machine. Then we're bringing this information and embedding this in the discrete event simulation, which tells us some risk, let's say, with a number of repetitions, which then bring to have a scheduling which is done aware of the risk we're having from the single machines. Then we're adding uh, the optimization with genetic algorithms, GA. So you see the fitness function of this genetic algorithm. So we're having a, a loop uh, for the decision at the end. Here you have uh, an impression. So I'm repeating a little bit these things, uh, but with some data. See, from the left, you cannot read anything, left top side, there is a number of data analytics uh, operations therein. Then we translate uh, into a visualization of the failure conformance value, which gives us, uh, through a logistic regression curve, the model we're using to know the healthiness of the single machine. 
Then we're introducing the model into the simulation. We are working uh, in a simulation-based optimization loop, so discrete event simulation with genetic algorithm. And we're obtaining, uh, through a number of iterations, see the abscissa, a good level for the MAKESPAN, which is the production performances we are reaching, we want to reach. At the end, uh, in terms of human-machine interface, uh, after the simulation-based model, optimization, sorry, we are having some information for the decision maker to decide which best decision for scheduling you may adopt. The one that minimizes the MAXPAN, the one that minimizes the standard deviation of the MAXPAN, or one that considers a fitness function of average and standard deviation of the MAXPAN. This is just an example, but just to say that we are reaching something after having considered the the stochasticity that comes from the healthiness of the machine. Once this is done, uh, what I would say, we have a digital twin for the single machine made uh, with statistical model or machine learning. We're having a, a digital twin for the whole production system, which embeds the result of the single uh, uh, digital twin of the single machine. So we're having two levels for the overall development of the digital twins. And I was using also optimization, genetic algorithm, but in my understanding, it's not a digital twin. It's something that is enabled by the prediction capability of the digital twins we're having in the system. If you can predict, you can try some optimization, but you're not doing offline, you're doing online. How you had some impression, I'm going to the conclusion as I see zero minutes left. I hope this, I was not running too much. I normally would spend uh, hours on this topic. And I would be happy, of course, to spend hours uh, later in the break and in the lunch and uh, whatever you want. Give me two minutes for the conclusion because I want then to reduce the pace uh, for this conclusion. Probably in, in the previous picture, I was fast in some matters. And so in that sense, it's good to have some discussion later on. Let me say that in this conclusion, I tried to synthesize two matters. One, I was discussing about the fact that digitalization is emphasizing the connection between physical and cyber layer. And in the cyber layer, we're having the virtualization through the digital twins. This is becoming real, potentially. Because once we have the infrastructure that enables the connection between physical and cyber layer, this is due to the Internet of Things, we can work on the virtualization of the real physical systems to, so to place it online. So we're achieving the digital twins. In my research, and so this was brought according to my research, digital twins may be related to the shop floor management. So then we can do uh, support to production execution, we can do control of production, uh, through the MESS, Manufacturing Execution System. We can make optimization of the schedules. These are all activities that we can do thanks to the virtualization we are having on, on the side of the normal system. And so probably enlarging to the overall picture of smart production planning and control, we may think that the digital twins can be placed on the side to react, but not just react, just to simple solve a problem to react with some prediction capabilities, so to optimize, so to be able to optimize on the reaction. So the dynamic capabilities we're having and the responsiveness in uncertain environment is the novelty I'm seeing from the digital twin perspective. Last but not least, on the modeling side, I believe that uh, we are having uh, potentials uh, when we're exploiting this potential in different levels of an architecture. So digital twins may be different and coordinated in the cloud, in the fog, or in the edge. We did some experience uh, with uh, Rodolfo, who is here, about this coordination. Of course, this helps to an approach which enables multidisciplinary ways to do things, because, uh, I repeat, the global level and the local level may be of different nature. Discrete event simulation, machine learning models, any, any runtime models which may be relevant to run online in this uh, achievement, we want to obtain high fidelity in the prediction capabilities. 
monitoring and prediction capabilities are, to my understanding, the main original role of digital twins. Optimization is not. It's enabled by digital twin, by its predictions, but optimization is just in the loop. But the digital twin is the main enabler than to get to an optimization model, as we did in the example I show you about genetic algorithms working together with the simulation model, working together with the machine learning on the bottom level. And at the end, I would say that in the future, if I put a flag just uh, to sell uh, a concept, uh, we're moving from Industry 4.0 to Industry 5.0, but let me say more precisely, I believe that augmentation decision-making made by humans uh, can be helped by digital twins. As is not the kind of model I was discussing until now. In my, I do not have any other experience of these new models, at least we did some work in the ontologies. Uh, I believe that this is a technology that is re may be relevant for the knowledge integration to help humans in augmented decisions. Today, some researchers are talking about cognitive digital twins, which is, uh, to me, a new way, a new part to be explored in my research field. I'm done. Sorry for being late. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Maki. Do we have some questions to our keynote speaker? Because I think the topic is incredibly interesting, so maybe some of you won't ask one, two questions. Uh, if not, I have a... Okay, we have one question, perfect. Uh, I have one question. Uh, digital twin, it can be possible to use in high mix, low volume production. High mix, low volume production. I believe that uh, I, I have, uh, uh, let's say, at the moment I have more experiences uh, in uh, high volumes. But I believe that uh, the variety, I mean, the variety is one matter uh, important to be solved uh, in a variety of production. And uh, digital twins uh, may help, let's say, in this exactly because uh, uh, the responsiveness uh, to the disturbances for many reasons uh, in the shop floor already. If it, the reason is a mix of different products, I think it's a special case of application which may bring a lot of benefits. My experience, I just have to be clear, the experience I was reporting were more, let's say, on a reduced mix, the one I reported. But we're doing some other experiences with the mixed assembly, mixed model assembly lines where you're having uh, uh, some changes in the mix, uh, not uh, because you're changing uh, the batch of products, but because the sequence of products is different. So you're having mixed model management in the line. Uh, in this case, uh, we are recognizing a number of disturbances that are, let's say, due also to the mix. And this uh, role of digital twins to help operators on the line uh, may have a potential. So I don't think uh, it's a matter of uh, the kind of production volumes or uh, mix. Probably, as we're moving to more product variety, it's a good space to explore to introduce digital twins because they may bring a number of potentials there. I hope I answered it, at least. Uh, I think... Uh with a low mix, uh, high mix production, it's difficult to build a model. This is a problem, because mostly models is uh, based on some data or training some machine learning process. I, 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 let me say, I agree partly, but I disagree with that part. <laughs> in the sense that I believe that it depends on the kind of model uh, you're adopting and also on the architecture you're adopting. I believe that uh, uh, building uh, the capability uh, to have uh, the proper data aligned to the mix uh, is part of the local digital twins. Uh, 
which may help to bring uh, you see, the proper probability distributions and also their changes. But of course, we can discuss about this uh, as this is a short answer. Okay, thank you, Professor Maki. No, one more question, okay. So. First of all, thank you for your presentation, Professor. Uh, I would like to ask a question about the historical data because you uh, talked about the training algorithm. So sometimes we, can, we can't obtain uh, the historical data because of the, you know, it can be expensive, it can, hard, can be hard to obtain from the production data. So do you have any other options, uh, some? I don't know, some simulations, some kind of simulations that we can uh, use instead of the real historical data. Thank you. In the digital twin concept, uh, uh, I see that you are building historical data because it's synchronized with the field. This is by definition. Of course, you have a starting point uh, with no data. So how to do with this? Uh, you are in the beginning of life with the digital twins. Uh, in my understanding, there are two possible ways, of course. Uh, one way is uh, to exploit uh, similar digital twins or similar physical assets. That are <coughs> on the other way, of course, uh, you may start uh, with some benchmarks, general benchmark uh, on the probability distribution of this data, and then evolve this uh, during the life. But by definition, the historical development uh, of data is part uh, of the digital twin because uh, you know it's a matter of adapting and adjusting uh, to the to the distribution. So in that sense, uh, somehow connected to my previous question, the production mix will be changing along life of the same planet. So how to adapt? Uh, we need to have some runtime models that enable the, this adaptation. It's not easy job, but it's part of the fact that we're having a, a runtime uh, which enables to build uh, historical data. For laboratory experiences, uh, sometimes we're using an approach, uh, so this is another part of the, of the story. For laboratory experience, sometimes we're using an approach uh, which build, uh, we call it physical twin, uh, just to generate data for the digital twin. This is a methodological way to solve the problem of not having historical data, but it's a methodological way to make research. Not, if I look at the application, I see that history comes uh, with the definition of this. Okay, thank you very much for the answer, Professor Maki. Uh, because we have a limited amount of time, so if somebody is interested with the speech and conversation with Professor, so I think it will be a lot of occasions, so lunch break, the coffee breaks, and of course gala dinner, so Professor Maki is always open for your questions and uh, uh, discussions. So, thank you for, uh, for your passions and my answers. Thank you very much, it was a great pleasure. Because we, uh, because we are a little delayed, but I must do this, so I want to personally uh, very warmly welcome the Rodolfo Haber, uh, Professor Rodolfo Haber, Director of uh, a very good research center from Madrid. So hello, Rodolfo, my friend. It's very nice to see you in Warsaw. And I must admit that I was a bit short because Rodolfo especially flight here for only one day. So nice to see you, Rodolfo, here. So. Okay, and the uh, uh, next presenter is also my friend from the same institution, so Fernando Castano. He will speak about the digital transformation, so I think we are in the same topic, so I think it will be also a great uh, experience and presentation, so the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank to Warsaw uh, University of Technology to be a speaker in this symposium. And now I, I will start in my presentation titled uh, Digital Transformation for Manufacturing SMEs, Some Keys and Enabling Technology of Industry 4.0. My name is Fernando Castaño and I'm working in the Center for Automation and Robotics. It's a joint task force for uh, Technical University of Madrid and the Spanish National Research Council. 
with uh, 13 research groups in the field of automation and robotics, and more than uh, 100 persons devoted to research and development. The main objective of, the, of the, uh, this center is to develop mainly applied research in order to provide useful results to society, uniquely to lead an ambitious work program in the areas of automation and robotics. Some of the, of the activities are centered around the scientific technological areas, such as monitoring and intelligent control, perception, artificial intelligence, and applied robotics. One important academic uh, activity are related with a very high quality postgraduate course that includes uh, uniquely the Master in Automation and Robotics in the Technical University of Madrid. Uh, specifically, I'm involved in the group of uh, advanced automation of matching high complex processes and environment. Uh, this group uh, was created in 1981 with the first milestone uh, was uh, design and development of the first Spanish CNC. Uh, was produced by Fagor Automation and sold by General Electric until uh, 1992. Another milestone are related with intelligent control, modeling, supervision of manufacturing processes, intelligent control, modeling, supervision beyond physical processes and system, and uh, issues related with smart manufacturing, digital twin, internet of things, and uh, taking, it account, taking into account a sustainability approach. The four main targets of this group are, uh, are uh, generating a scientific, a scientific and technical uh, knowledge in the conjunction, conjunction and intersection of discipline, contribute for transferring knowledge to society, disseminate knowledge, and to promote the development of intelligent control technology and generate our own know-how. One of the main activities uh, of our group is related with Industry 4.0 and its enabling te technology, such as uh, cyber physical system, Internet of Things, and digital twin, and, tr and to transfer this uh, knowledge to manufacturing SMEs. Another, another transfer of knowledge are related con, with exploitation results. Uh, as, as you can be seen, as, uh, the, the, history, the, the history of the game knowledge transfer uh, from uh, net, network monitoring and supervision system throughout intelligent monitoring system and cyber physical system for monitoring. This, this exploitation result was obtained for, uh, in several uh, private contracts with companies. Uh, one of these exploitation results uh, are related with the creation of a startup related with the game group. Several members of the group have created the, uh, this uh, startup dedicated to digital transformation of the industrial sector and, and services using the transparency of the artificial intelligence. This startup uh, was, uh, is an, uh, an a spin off. Uh, of, the, of the Technical University of Madrid and the Spanish National Research Council, thanks to a license of an industrial sec secret from Gamhi. The symbol, uh, the, the main activity is redefining the real time factory traceability and control for, for industry. Uh, one of the slogans. Uh, this uh, offers uh, customized services for connected industry 4.0. Uh, one of the enabling technology that offers Symbol uh, is a radio frequency identification based solution for traceability and control. Uh, this system provides total control in real time over each unit, batch or pallet produced or handled in the plant or distribution center. The main benefits are related with real-time traceability of units, batches or pallets, automatic update of the status and location of each reference, and no need for operator intervention. Another technology 
is a Internet of Things infrastructure uh, in order to facilitate the capture, traceability, and management of processed data following communication, encryption, and security standard for the industrial Internet of Things. Uh, the main benefits uh, are ability to connect any type of machinery, sensor, device, management and processing of processed data in real time, security and traceability in collective data. Another, in this case, another service that's offered is a data driving business intelligence to provide uh, the necessary digital to tools to optimize access and management of tax personnel processes, consumption, times and costs in real time. Uh, this, this platform has three different TL factors, uh, level of optimization, access to relevant information, and optimal management. The main benefits are an increase of 8% in production time, 10% of, tra of traceability of manufactured products, 0% use of paper, annotation errors, and or loss of information. Another technology is an optimal resource manager that optimizes the planning and allocation of human and material resources in production environment through an heuristic analysis of relevant uh, production, logistic, and economic indicators. The main benefits are between 9 and 10 percent improvement in the use of stack in assigned tax, 7 and 3 percent improvement in task completion time, and personalized recommendation on and actions required to meet objective. Now I, I will present a case of success, specifically a, success, a successful case of SME from 0% to 100% connected for optimal and sustainability, sustainable management. This uh, SME is Pinazo, that is a manufacturing SME specialized in the design, manuf manufacture and assembly of polyester and met metal electric cabinet for companies in the electrical sector. Uh, they have a family business located in Madrid, Spain. They have more than uh, uh, 45 years of, of experience and they cover the full value chain. Our commitment to continuous improvement and have a current presence in the national and international market. An SME is always a game chain. Science taking that first step is often the greatest challenge. We need to, to show uh, uh, that, the, the, that the, the chain is uh, necessary. For example, we have data in this company, uh, they have out of stock and difficult access to updated production indicators. And, and later you have to show the, the solution or the, that we propose. For example, the implementation of a ro robust and reliable traceability and control system. And then uh, we will to show the, the benefits that uh, they have obtained. For example, for example, a view of 360 degrees of the production and business indicators in real time. Uh, when, when you want to, to, to have success in, in the development of this kind of project, it's important to divide it in different key stages. In our case, we divide it in three stages, technology, team, and financing. In the first stage, we, we, have, uh, we need to identify the current maturity level of the company. Using for this some questions. For, for example, are there measurement elements? Are you ready for the industrial internet of things? Is there communication infrastructure in the plant? Uh, from, this, from the result of this, uh, of this question, we, we can uh, design and offer uh, customized, scalable, and design for, for the human services. In the next stage, we identify uh, key roles within uh, the company. For example, representative of the entire value chain, 
mentalizing with the needs for change, and we will be trusted partners uh, in terms of uh, commitment to certain metrics and to continuous improvement on these services. And the last stage related with find uh, uh, financial methods in order to, to work together. For example, uh, 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 the, the, the European Union cascading funding element. For example, Soft for CF, Kids for SME, or Zero Defense Manufacturing Project. The next step in the development of the project is the uh, development of the platform that we can offer to the company. Uh, the platform is a cloud-based platform for connected industry 4.0 in industrial SMEs. Uh, in order to redefine, to redefine the traceability control and management of the industrial SME sector. The specification of, the pla of, the, of, the, uh, of this platform are uh, scalable services platform, uh, radio frequency identification technology and reliable data infrastructure. In addition, uh, we have created an, a service related with customized business intelligence. The, the results report uh, related with, with a study of the production indicator during the eight months after the commissioning of all contracted services uh, arise uh, an increase uh, in their real-time traceability, productivity and OEE. Perhaps the most standing is that the, the company uh, keeps the same uh, shop floor staff, there are no downs downsizing, uh, playoffs, etc. Another way to quantify the impact, uh, we can divide it in tangibles, not tangibles, and ambitious objectives. In tangibles, uh, we have detected an increase in the use of full time, we have uh, dated an uh, increase in the manufacture uh, of, of parts of pieces and an increase in turnover. In not tangibles, we have dated a proactive management and decision making, payment or remuneration according to actual performance, gamification and employee motivation, and a new digital culture, culture and work philosophy. In addition, we have dated an ambitious objective related we have to, to, to achieve the, the objective to optimize 10% uh, more of resources planning. As conclusion, uh, as, as you can be seen, it, she is the operation director of the uh, Talleres Electromecánicos Pinazo in Madrid. His name is, his name is uh, Marta Pinazo and taking the first step toward digitization was not an easy decision for managers and operator, operators. Months later, thanks to, to SimView, we are more decisive every day. We manage our resources better and we control our production uh, in real time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fernando. Do we have some questions to our guest? Okay, we, we have coming. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, firstly, apologies for arriving later due to my airplane. But anyway, my comment uh, is about the presentation uh, of, of that made Fernando. The focus uh, is indeed to point out the need of, of fostering the, the cooperation between academia and industry. Sometimes it's impossible for universities and research institutions to carry out a specific, to deal with a specific challenge uh, of SMEs. And uh, when you set up a, a spin-off or, or, or a startup uh, at the university level, this is not straightforward. You have to face a lot of problems related with the transfer of technology, uh, patent licensing, and so on. But indeed, at, at the end, you find a way of, of, of contributing to generating new knowledge to the society. And this is what uh, Fernando wanted to point out in this spin-off. 
uh, related with uh, how we can bring our knowledge from academia to the industry in uh, creating or transferring this, this knowledge uh, we are able to, to, to offer new kind of, of solutions that usually a research group or a research institution or university is not able to, to bring. This is one, 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 one important comment. And the second, secondly, in, uh, this motivation, this, this talk is basically to motivate young people in, in, in the auditorium that there are many, we, you have plenty of opportunities beyond academia, not, not only in the academia, to, to, to explore digitalization and industrial 4.0 challenge. Because indeed there, is, there are many gaps already pointed out by, uh, I arrived later, I couldn't listen to other speakers before Marco, but Marco pointed out the, the digital twin is, is indeed one, one of, 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 of the pillar for this. But there are many, many things to be done in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adolfo, for your incredible, nice comments. So, uh, do we have some other comments, questions regarding to this Fernando presentations? Uh, okay, if not, so thank you very much once again for Fernando. Uh, and uh, the last but not least guest before the lunch break uh, will be representative of the industry, so the smart tech company. Uh, Anna Gembarska, uh, and as if you open your bags, welcome back. So the one of the gift is from the smart tech company. So uh, this is the 3D technology uh, company. So I think the presentation will be very, very nice. Uh, so the floor is of course yours. Okay. In the mean, in the meantime, we are preparing the presentation. Ah, uh, yeah, it's over here. Uh, I would like to thank organizers for inviting me here. I'm a bit stressed out because I was here around 20 years ago finishing this department. So, you know, being a speaker, <laughs> uh, it's a bit awkward. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like to focus on application of uh, precise metrological 3D scanners in the industry for zero because that's what smart tech company produces. Uh, I'm a managing director and a co-founder and talking about spin-offs, we started as a spin-off 22 years ago, so don't be afraid, it works. <laughs> um, we believe in the company that the future of metrology is in 3D optical contactless measurements. And uh, as it is about industry for zero, I thought maybe we'll just go through not reading, but go through through the industries. We are now after mechanization, electrification, digitalization in uh, internet networks. So at uh, the last point, you can see 3D technologies. But when you go through the Google, you see more, more and more of industry 5.0, which is more human centric and even more deep self-learning. Uh, so uh, where we are, somewhere in industry for zero, already heading into industry uh, five zero. And in both of those industries, uh, 3D scanners place have a very big role. So about scanning technologies, just a short overview of the scanning, most, mostly known scanning technologies. The first one you can see there are geodetic scanners, so that's time of flight technology for big uh, objects like building, terrain. The accuracy top is two millimeters, but generally it's around 10 millimeters because that's enough for those objects. The other one is triangulation. Um, laser triangulation, so that's for small objects with medium complexity, accuracy, generally now is uh, up to 0.5 millimeter and, uh, and it's based on the laser beam or now multiple laser beams uh, projected on the object. And the one that we focus on since over 20 years, structural light scanners, small and medium objects with high complexity because it's a full field measurement with accuracy up to few microns. Now being extended to large scale by photography, a photogrammetry module, 
I don't want to focus too much on the products. I want to focus more on the applications in Industry 4.0. But just for your understanding, um, okay, I would like to show you what a structural light full field scanning is about. What exactly is a 3D scanner? It is a device that allows you to transfer a real object to a digital environment. It's like a portal, transferring real objects into the digital world. The 3D scanner projects a sequence of fringes on the object. Those bend along the curvature of the scanned object. This process is recorded by detectors installed in the device, and as a result, we get millions of points on the computer screens. Those points form ideal model that reflect perfectly a real object. Each point is described as a geometric coordinates, X, Y, Z, and RGB color information. This is how we obtain our digital twin. This exact model can be further processed in dedicated Smartec 3D measure software for quality control, reverse engineering, documentation, visualization, and many other applications. So, as you can see, there are endless possibilities where we can use 3D scanning nowadays. Different sectors, different industries. That's the line of our products, both for industry and non-technical application, and also those specialized for industries for, for zero, robotized ones. Uh, old scanners um, feature uh, well, the below uh, non-technical applications feature color scanning also, which is uh, unusual for scanners as they come from uh, automotive industry where uh, the color was not needed. And about the company, just a short overview, we are a Polish manufacturer uh, of uh, optical scanners. The company was founded in 2000, as I said, as a spin-off from Warsaw University of Technology. Uh, right now, we sail worldwide, and uh, what we are most focused on is metrological uh, verification of uh, our system. And of course, we believe that we need to constantly develop uh, our uh, products some users so those now we are heading to the applications you can see many logos from automotive but not only there are also uh, companies from um, museums and archaeological museums um, like national museum of prehistory in taiwan uh, and many many others uh, so as i said there are different sectors first sector um, that's uh, industry, uh, automotive industry, aerospace industry. That's where the systems are most popula po popular. Um, the education is the second one. Um, and right now, museum and archaeology are emerging really, really fast. Now, let's think, is that an industry? In a common sense, no. But uh, as we see it from the company side, it is already become an industry, and you can say it's heading to an industry for zero when you talk about uh, the measurements of really big amounts of collections, um, museum collections. The advantages of 3D scanning. 3D scanning is a next step after CMM machine. So first we had tactile scanning where it was uh, necessary to touch with a probe or with a CMM machine to measure the object. And uh, since now we have most of the objects that have free-form geometry, it's really difficult and time-consuming to tactile measure these objects. So we needed a tool to uh, be able to um, scan, to measure the objects with a high accuracy and metrological verification. So we have precision, we have speed because it's full field measurement as you've seen on the film. We, have, uh, we can have full automa automation of quality control and reverse engineering. 
we have convenience because we can share um, the results uh, of work at any time. And of course, which is very popular now, additive manufacturing, so direct scan to uh, 3D print. Ease of use, because there is no specialized knowledge required, uh, because all the scanners are plug and scan, so you just start the work after short one day training. And uh, of course, quality. And um, now talking about the simplest example, of usage of the uh, scanner in automotive industry, you can see the, our client who is designing the truck cabin based on 3D scans. Now we can think, is that an um, uh, industry 4.0? Hmm, I would say maybe 3.0 more because scanners were already there, uh, but it is a uh, connection, uh, connection between the um, between non-contactless uh, scanning and direct connection to design. Uh, so um, this client is making um, the modernization of uh, fire trucks based on the scans performed with uh, our scanners. The other one, similar, but also involving 3D print, is uh, customization of dedicated motorcycle accessories. Uh, here we have, uh, on the first picture, you can see scanners scanning the engine of Enduro motorcycle uh, where the design for this engine has been designed based on the 3D scanning. And then on the last picture, on the last picture you can see um, the uh, cover printed directly in metal based on what has been uh, scanned. And moving to the industry 4.0, we have um, quality control directly on the production line. And that's uh, one of our uh, systems working, dedicated systems working in Opel factory in Rasselheim. It has been quality control of the car's headlining on the assembly line. Before, it was all made by human. Uh, it's the positioning of the foams that you see on the first picture on the, your left. Um, and then control of the positions of the foams directly on the production lines because they are crucial when talking about accidents, behavior of the roof uh, during the accidents. The result of implementation of such a system was um, making uh, or quality control processed within a minute and uh, giving you direct PDF um, file, because that's what client wanted, with go, uh, no-go information about the position of each phone. How did it look? Here are some screens, uh, most of the photos, uh, because we're not able to, to, to uh, do it there on the, on the production line. So that's the measurement that you see. Um, it was fully customized to clients need, Metrology certified, of course, fully automated. Here you can see the robotic arms placing uh, the foams and straight after that the, hook, the headline was heading into our control system and being controlled within uh, one minute and then each PDF has been printed out and glued on the headline. That's how it looked. Uh, it was of course compared with a CAD model, it was dimensional quality inspection and in the moment you will see how it worked uh, when changing uh, intentionally here, changing the position of one of the foams. As you can see, it's moved like five millimeters, maybe less. And here on the bottom, you see that the deviation are not in tolerance and then such, uh, such uh, um, part is no-go uh, for the rest of the production. 
The other and uh, the other application I would like to talk. It was again um, customized system because the system is not only the scanner itself. It has been mounted on the robotic arm, so it was uh, fully automated, but also consisting of customized software. Uh, software that uh, detected um, defects uh, and placed it on the map of the gas uh, turbine that was inspection uh, software made for uh, General Electrics. And so as a result, we got um, categorized defects according to the categorization of, uh, that client has gave us. And it was saving time because normally uh, such inspection was uh, made by hand uh, with special experts that are not quite a few, only a few in the world. So this is um, making it fully automated um, on the, in, the in, in factory, in the service factory during the service of, of uh, gas turbine. The last one uh, from the last year is uh, robotized quality inspection station in, uh, for aerospace industry uh, for a Chinese uh, client. It was sent to China. And uh, what, what were the aims? It was boosting efficiency of quality control by shortening the time, enhancing accuracy of the process to 40 microns, uh, 0.4 millimeters, and allowing 3D visualization of the deviation map directly on the object because that's the newest feature we have. Not only you can compare the CAD model and have your um, map of deviation on the screen, but you can uh, project it back on the uh, object itself to visualize um, your uh, employee, your uh, co-worker, your um, business partner, where the um, defects uh, are, or to prove that uh, the parts that you have acquired from, your, from a different company doesn't look as it's supposed to do. So shortly about this system, You can see it was made uh, with KUKA arm. Highest resolution of scanning 20 megapixels from one direction. This solution speed up the scanning process. The entire stand is controlled by our outdoor software SmartTech 3D Measure, uh, equipped with the uh, automatic quality control module. In the first stage, the operator prepares a measurement plan in which he defined the directions and position of robot. Then he prepared the control report template in which it is um, possible to generate the color map of deviation or the, of the entire uh, data or label with the point measurement of uh, deviation. An additional feature of this solution is the possibility to project the color deviation map image directly from the scanner onto measurement object. And I almost forgot to say that um, I didn't focus on the technology that much because you can see it by yourself. It is on the floor number one. Uh, so you can check out, you can ask any questions you want uh, about, the, about the technology and see it in, in, in real life. So just to end, uh, the question I asked before, national heritage preservation, industry of its own. And I was thinking, because here I have digital twin, and here, <laughs> here the digital twin is not the same as, uh, as it was in the presentation. The digital twin for people from museums, it's the digital physical twin uh, with color, with geometry that they can virtually cut, make a research, do the 3D printing, uh, documentation for R&D and also for insurance companies. Um, so that's very important. And I would say looking at the rise of the sales of systems for um, museums and archaeology, that it is uh, industry on its own also needing full 
uh, automatization of the process, especially that those people are not technical, so they don't want to get into, into technology. They just want to have digital twin made. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer email or right now or by the scanner or during the coffee breaks. Thank you very much for a beautiful presentation. And do we have some questions? Okay. Thank you very much for uh, for your presentation. Uh, one question came to my mind. It's a little uh, beyond <laughs> the topic of your presentation, but it, I, I was wondering, what is your personal opinion on uh, quantum imaging and uh, quantum ghost imaging and possible applications, uh, is it somehow on your technology roadmap? Uh, uh, do you see it in 10 years, 20? Uh, because we know already that there are already existing uh, military and medical applications for ghost imaging. What's your opinion about uh, industrial options for, for such technology? Do you have some? Um. Well, I don't want to predict or I don't want to give any estimations. I think, I think um, it is happening, but, uh, but not 10 years. I would say that's a minimum when we talk about, when we talk about industry. That's how I see it uh, from, from my point of view. Um, depending, of course, depending where, but... Uh, Still, we are, uh, after those 20 years, we are still educating uh, companies and industries about uh, um, digital twins, about Industry 4.0, so, um, so it's not yet, uh, as you said, it's not yet on our road plan, on our road map, because I think it's too far ahead. We are. I, I think uh, that uh, for um, research and development in really big companies, we know, or as you said, in the military, it's already happening. Mm, but for, let's say, small size company like me, it's still, uh, it's still a future, yeah. Thank you very much. Bart, do, uh, are you satisfied on the answer? Or? We have some one question out of the door. Yes, thank you for the presentation. My, my question is about uh, there is a trend in, in, in this in metrology uh, related with embedding intelligence locally at sensor level, uh, such as intelligence and, and communication, both. When I'm talking about intelligence, means uh, algorithm already, so beyond not only. Sensing, but beyond sensing, are you uh, in the products uh, exploiting this capability, or do you plan in future to add this capability? Because uh, there are new opportunities in many future calls of European projects in which there are opportunity of embedding intelligence or adding intelligence to to sensors. Thank you. Yes, and that's exactly what is on our roadmap. <laughs> so adding, uh, we have, uh, we have, I have my own uh, department of uh, uh, software engineers that are uh, working. Uh, some of them are working also on the involving um, IE into uh, our scanners. But we are uh, looking, uh, looking also at the founding possibilities to. Uh, strongly uh, involve IE into into the scanning process itself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. One more question we have. For... Okay. If not, we have. Okay. One more. Yeah, Juan Hernandez. Uh, in in biology, we we have a lot of uh, problems that while scanning, we need to know the thickness or the composition. For example, in the eye, we can, we can scan the, the retina, but we need to know if the retina has the right thickness. 
or if the retina has a kind of problem with, with the composition, chemical composition. Do you have any instrument or you plan to develop instruments that are going to be used for scanning biological tissues and giving us those kind of information? Yes, there are several problems when scanning um, biological tissues generally. When we talk about skin uh, as it is, it's easier. Uh, when we talk about eye, because that's what you're asking, yeah, that's more difficult because the eye, um, this is structural light technology. That means that the light has to reflect from the object. Uh, and also, it's a field measurement, so we uh, measure only thing that we see. Uh, so, to measure the thickness of something, yes, uh, we even had some R&D about it. You can use different wavelength to get into the skin, deeper into the skin, like if an infrared, uh, uh, but uh, probably not with the eye, it wouldn't work. Uh, so uh, yes, we are working. We are working on with medical applications, but uh, but the eye is really difficult subject. Thank you very much. And one more question, yes. Uh, can you scan uh, mirror surfaces or high polishing surfaces, or you need to use a spray? No, I mean no high reflected surfaces. Well, of course, we cannot measure mirror surfaces. Uh, it's impossible uh, because of the technology. Uh, this can be done with uh, some of laser scanners. And, and But high reflective, yes, we are dealing with that already. We have uh, a special algorithms that enable uh, to scan um, highly reflective, uh, highly reflective uh, surfaces. Uh, without spraying, but for really uh, like chromium or mirror, yes, we have to spray because of the technology. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. The discussion is very interesting, but the lunch is waiting, and I know that many of you are hungry. Yes. But of course, you can uh, you can invite the, the lady during the lunch. Yes, and, and of course, Congress. So uh, now we have a break for the lunch. So the lunch will be exactly in the same room that the coffee break was. So 341 on the third floor. And we will meet. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And we will meet uh, here in 2 p.m. And the next presenter will be Rodolfo. So I think it will be also good.
I was muted. Can you hear me now? Hi. So now the voice transmission should be fine as well. Okay, I'm hearing myself, but Okay, the delay between me saying something and it coming out of the noise is quite long. Hello, hello, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm trying to figure out if I hear myself. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Okay, I do hear myself. Maybe I give it another try and another try and another try and another try. Let's see what the outcome will be.
I would pray so welcome after the lunch break. I hope that you enjoy your meal. Uh, so you have a lot of energy now and power. I know that maybe some of you won't sleep a little, but please don't do this because presentation will be very, very interesting. So I have a great uh, pleasure to host here uh, Professor Rodolfo Haber. As I said, he's a director of the very good research center in Madrid. So they uh, made a research in a many interesting fields and applications, but of course Rodolfo will explain this uh, himself. So. Uh, Please welcome Rodolfo and the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Christoph. Firstly, I, I wish to thank Christoph, uh, Bart, Miros, all colleagues. No, <laughs> <laughs> all colleagues from Warsaw University of Technology. The, Christoph, another Christoph, the second one that picked up. Uh, I would like to apologize because I arrived late yesterday, I arrived today very late. Uh, from many problems with airplanes and so on. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure basically because I'm here because some years ago uh, I met with a colleague from Politecnico of Milano and he told me that I had to discover an, a, an excellent person who is Professor Stanislav Strechtalk. Sorry for my pronunciation. And thanks to him I'm here, basically here, because on the basis of his cooperation, we launched a cooperation, Christoph, Miros, Bart, and the other colleagues follow this. Uh, and these few words are basically for, for him and for, from his early recovery. Said that, my talk is slightly different of the, of the previous one. I apologize, I only see my, uh, my, my friend presentation, Marco, Professor Marco Macchi, that uh, make an excellent presentation about uh, digital twins and uh, my presentation is basically focused on what we have done in in the Center for Automation and Robotics in the last years relating with digital transformation. Indeed the concept of Industria 4.0, this is the this is the, the scope of my presentation. Firstly I will make a very short introduction, later I'm going to talk about automation and robotics from and where are we going to and I, I will I will briefly show some successful story and giving some concluding remarks indeed uh, the, the, the topic of industry of industry 4.0 introduced in early 2012 uh, represents indeed a, a, a qualitative change what, what we happened in the, in the what happened in the last 20 years in industry but this, the need of, of bringing this uh, new communication, new intelligence to the whole value change is also translating to other fields, not only to industry. And this is what my presentation want to point out. Okay, well, we, I'm not going to, to spend so much time here. My colleague Fernando already mentioned the Center for Automation and Robotics is a task force of Universidad Politécnica de Madrid and the Spanish Council for Scientific Research. It represents an effort, an effort to, to sum, to sum efforts to, 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 do, to, to bring the capability of doing more things in a, better, in a better way. We have two locations, one in Madrid and another one in Angarda, and we are dealing with these four pillars, smart robotics, intelligent control and supervision, applied robotics, and precision. And my, my presentation will try to, to show you what we are doing in the field of digital transformation, not only in industry, uh, in these in this four, four pillars. Okay, uh, now I'm the director of this research center, and unfortunately, I don't have enough time to do the things that I really like to do, but it happens. It Maybe here I can see someone that is facing the same situation for administrative and other duties. Anyway, we have in the, one of the main characteristics of our research center is that we have facilities. Facilities is essential in engineering. It's essential for transfer of knowledge to companies because you need to make some proof of concepts. You need to do some experimentals to carry out some uh, viability studies. And we have, these are, in this slide, I would like to point out different uh, singular, oh, sorry. I, I have not watched this, which is the button, I guess, this one. We have, sorry, 
We have different facilities, including uh, for autonomous driving system, also for manufacturing. Uh, this is our lab, the lab in which Fernando and myself are involved, but other related with energy and uh, assistive robotics and also unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, this, is, uh, this is important uh, message we need to prove. Uh, we, we need to demonstrate what we are doing if we really want that this studies has an impact on, on companies. Okay, automation and robotics. This is not very common now because as far as you know, uh, the participation of Spain in, industrial, in the first industrial revolution was very limited. There are many, yes. okay, I want to be politically correct. I'm not going to be politically incorrect here in Poland, but there are yes, real reasons for this situation that motivate that these people that I'm showing in this, in this slide cannot influence in, 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 in impact in the society. I would like to point out because just as early as of, of 1889, one guy called Isaac Peral designed and implemented the first submarine. But no one believed in him. Uh, and it was a pity because many things would be very different nowadays if this submarine participated in the war at that time. The second guy that I would like to mention is Juan de la Sierva. Not, not so far ago, in 1939, no one believed in this device called Autohero that later American copy, patented, and create all device stuff that we know in, in now. And then this is another guy, Leonardo Torres Quevedo, that designed the airship and many other devices. Unfortunately, what I would like to mention in this slide is that in all of our countries we have relevant people, but unfortunately sometimes policymakers have not understood the science and technology as should be. Anyway, say that uh, I have only a few minutes uh, to talk about automation and robotics. My, my point, I will try to be direct to the point. The point is what we are facing in the coming years is hyper-automation. What is hyper-automation? It's basically automation is going everywhere driven by artificial intelligence and robotics. We can say in another way, later in my presentation, I will, I will show you. We can say that artificial intelligence is fueling everything. We can say that robotics is enabling many things due to automation and artificial intelligence. But indeed, hyper-automation is something that is unavoidable. Unavoidable for any company nowadays, unavoidable for any, in any research topic, basically because we have to face how are we able to harmonize. So we need, we have to overcome the current limitations of our methods. Basically, we have in companies isolated departments, IT department, mechanical department, or we have isolated groups. This is something that uh, the, the group of my colleague uh, Marco Maki, Professor Maki in, in, in Polimi, has already understood. They have people from different areas, different areas working together. But this is important. If we really want to harmonize these technologies, we need multidisciplinary research teams. And this is one message. The second message is this is not straightforward to automate the whole value exchange. What, what, what I mean the whole value exchange means that we have to develop methods not only centered on a machine or on a device. You, we need to deal with the whole value exchange from the design of the product up to the commercialization, to the whole business process. And this is something that I'm not pointing out. This is something that uh, Gartner, who is one of the main company, uh, consultant companies, has pointed out as one of the main challenges for 2022. Okay, and what about control? Okay, control is different. We, um, when we teach at, in different schools, control engineering, when we teach modeling, uh, things are has evolving very fast in very fast in the coming years. This this slide is similar to others, but pointed out how things have changed a lot in the last, I don't know, 50 or 60 years. It's starting at the beginning, what was important was mechanics. What on the bottom is this one? Yes, the mechanics. Later, we discover circuit systems. Okay, servo systems. This is terrible for the war. 
Then we discovered Control 3.0, microprocessor, digital computers. Then we enter in network control systems, intelligent control systems, and the role of internet. But now what is happening? What is happening is nowadays that we have very few laws and big data. And the problem is that we have to deal with data-driven approaches to deal with limited casualty, uh, uncertainty, diversity, and complexity. The problem is that we, move, we are moving from big laws, equations, uh, with small data, to small laws with big data. Indeed, any engineering approach should be supported just in the middle, because we need to know some physical laws, but we need also to exploit data. OK, said this evolution, OK, I'm not going to reproduce what Pricewater, uh, Cooper Consultant Companies pointed out. I like this slide because in a very few uh, um, pictures summarize the evolution for, for the creation of robots. And basically, this slide and the next one want to point out how artificial intelligence has been present in our lives from in the last 20, at least in the last 25, 30 years. Uh, of course, this evolution here, you can see some, some important topics related with autonomous driving, with uh, different robotics application solutions at home, Alexa, whatever be, and so on. But, but now we are entering in a new phase. What is a new phase? Robotics is going beyond the beginning. The be at the beginning, we have a device that can enable, facilitate in, 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 auto, in, in, an, in a company production, but now we need more. What we are facing is robotics or robots that are able to communicate, to interact with us, to work with us. And this is the challenge. We need robots able to work with us, to interact and to work with us. Let's see. But uh, unfortunately, this the part of this slide I forgot to put in English, but anyway, the, the, the main goal of this slide is to point out that in robotics there are many areas that is being explored uh, nowadays. Indeed, in all of these areas, the common point is that it's necessary to in, include more computing power in robots, more AI in robots to make robots to provide, to enable robots to do things that up to date are not able to do. And for the reason, I'm talking about, uh, it's interesting because this is related with perception, as uh, former, uh, the former speaker for company talked about the need uh, to exploit 3D imagines, but also related with positioning, navigation, and control. This is essential. Uh, this is something that nowadays is available when you go to the market and you buy a, a cleaning robot. But now you, we need to go beyond robotics, uh, beyond, robot, beyond industry, sorry means how we are able to, to bring more bio-inspiration in robotics. OK, we have talked about automation. We have talked about robotics. Let's see what we have done to try to, to do in automation and robotics beyond Industry 4.0. Industry is only one pillar. Uh, I'm not going to concentrate. We are doing, we are running two, two European projects, uh, very big European projects related with uh, Industria 4.0. One is, man is, is led by uh, Infineon Technologies in Germany. It's related with manufacturing, in, uh, adding intelligence to, to, to manufacturing processes. And the second one is related with artificial intelligence for SMEs. Tomorrow, some colleagues from Warsaw uh, will talk about it. But I'm going to talk about different things. The first project is about perception. We have, okay, perception, sensors. Yes, this is important. This is uh, an Europe, a, big, a big European initiative that we are running nowadays. Uh, this initiative uh, is, is about how can we go beyond the state of the art in sensing. And what we are doing is to try to provide new services by, based on information get from uh, people and environment. And this is something that is, it's increasing in the, in the era of Internet of Things. We are able to, uh, to exploit this information. Information from sensors, but also information coming from people who have sensors and devices and uh, from the environment. The second one is about 
per section, but in agriculture. We say Industria 4.0, in agriculture, field, area, sector, they talk about agriculture 4.0, basically, because they are trying to bring sensors, actuators, artificial intelligence uh, to agriculture. This is one example that we are doing now. The project with laser is focused on using the laser technology. In this case, embedding these sensor technologies and artificial intelligence techniques to improve not the perception itself, but also the decision making about different kinds of, 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 of the need of, of use air bases to, to, to eliminate uh, the main widths. Uh, the main widths. And this is really, really challenging. So we are talking going beyond perception. We need to sense, we need to add intelligence, not necessarily only intelligence. We, there are many classic algorithms that can be combined and uh, apply effectively. And at the end, apply this. OK, this is about agriculture. But perception goes beyond that. We can combine this perception with autonomous vehicles. In this case, this is not a vehicle. This is autonomous uh, air, air system, a drone. That, and we are using this drone plus perception to what? To do what? In this case, this is a real project that we are running now with Airbus, I guess, with Airbus. To do what? To put with cameras and other sensors that I not talk about it now due to confidentiality. To do what? To do the in inspection. But we can do the same to inspect energy tower system. This is a project that we are running with Iberdrola, one of the biggest energy supply company in Spain. And what we can also do for inspection inside big, big uh, burner systems. This is one example. So we can combine sensing system, perception system with other technologies to, to do what? To go beyond the technical state of the art. But of course, uh, this, we cannot forget bio-inspiration. And we are also, my glasses, mm -mm. Okay, what, what I would like to point out that we are also researching or how we can design better robots. How? Trying to imitate uh, different animals, different life principles. And uh, this is uh, some designs, different designs that we, have, uh, that we have been working and we are working on about robots inspired on, on, on fish Robots inspired on bats. Here you can see the, the practical the implementation. And why it is necessary? Because we need to reduce energy consumption, because we need to make system more efficient, we need to develop faster systems, and, and so on. OK. But bio inspiration means that we can also exploit robotics in health. We have been talking about agriculture, we have been talking about industry, inspection system and so on, but this is about health, it's about assistive systems. This is one example of one robotic system that we have developed. Here, this system is now under clinical validation in Chicago with 70 patients. Have you seen? This is a complex robotic system with different sub-devices. Uh, the goal is that this kind of robotic system can be used by, by uh, therapists to do what? To improve the quality of life. Of course, this is not mechanics. This is more than mechanics. You need a lot of control systems for different, uh, in different places. You need a computational architecture to, to coordinate the whole system. So, what, I'm want, what I want to point out here is, once again, we need robotics, we need control, and we need to integrate methods for artificial intelligence to, to develop these kind of devices. OK. What else? What is this slide about? OK. But transportation is challenging. And this is, this is like one to, I'm going to mention now about two European projects that we are running now in the field of transportation. Well, we need to develop a new generation of autonomous driving. Everybody has listened, is aware about what Tesla is doing in this field. 
And uh, this is a big project dealing with how we embed intelligence to to uh, autonomous driving systems. And uh, this is quite important because one autonomous, one vehicle is, is basically another kind of autonomous robot indeed. And this is one example of what we are doing uh, in the field of navigation, in the field of positioning, in the field of uh, combining different uh, coordinated, coordinating robots, robotic system, uh, but also doing simulation. This is digital twins, because we are talking about digital twins necessary, that in which virtual space uh, and physical uh, the space can interact and can communicate together. Finally, I'm approaching to the end. Uh, the second one is about cyber security. Of, of course, okay, okay. To talk about cyber security in, in, in this symposium, I think maybe it's not okay. It's not exactly the right place, but we cannot skip. We cannot forget. And I, I put it. I prepared this slide basically to point out that this is another pepper and salt for for the food that we are cooking every day. So we cannot avoid cyber security issues. And this project led by uh, NXP, which is the, the, one of the main manufacturer of components, uh, uh, automotive components, is indeed focus, focus the attention on, on trying to uh, deal with cyber security by way, by, by how? By redundancy, which is a typical well known, but also the sub-scenario and in how autonomous and connected vehicles, where the driver may be eventually requested to take over control, can be securely safeguarded from external threats when onboard and infrastructure-based information are fused together within the vehicle. Two different driving situations were considered using a highly automated vehicle in CSIC's urban-like proving grounds close to Madrid, Spain. The Secretas Common Framework for Safety, Security and Privacy, developed with this project and uh, considered as uh, best practices, are used in this scenario to handle threats attacking an automated vehicle uh, via communication channels. Automated vehicles can get information through wireless communications from the infrastructure or from other vehicles which provides a better understanding of the driving In addition to that, an alarm was sent to the surrounding vehicles that an automated vehicle was nearby and could eventually represent a danger. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go this this presentation. Uh, I, I have sent this uh, the PDF. I can we can distribute the PDF of the presentation. Is uh, so you can. In the near future, mobility users will benefit uh, from an alarm. Okay. Uh, finally, this is a new project uh, in which we are also putting emphasis now on cognition. Uh, it's interesting because uh, Professor uh, Marco Macchi mentioned the, the word cognitive. We need to bring, to go back uh, to the 70s and 80s and try to re-elaborate, try to revisite uh, some of the methods developed in the 80s and, and uh, 70s, in which computational uh, power was the computational uh, power was not enough at that time, and now we can refashion some of these methods. And this is about how we can uh, improve, incorporate these cognitive, uh, artificial cognitive systems in control, perception, and, and planning. This is another. Uh, in this case, is led by ABL. And uh, finally, I will spend one minute in this project that we are running in our lab. It's the project Power to Power. I, I mentioned previously, this project was led, is led by, uh, by Infineon, and it's, it's a very big project at European level. What we are doing is combining digital twins and physical uh, systems in order to improve uh, remaining useful life detection systems. And this is what we are finishing, and we have to, to finish in the, coming, in the coming month. Once again, one pillar is digital twin. In this case, digital twin of both parts of a motor and a driver. 
but also artificial intelligence. Yes, artificial intelligence for modeling and decision making, basically. And the, the challenge is to improve remaining useful life. Okay, my concluding remarks. The future, okay, everybody is talking about industry, but industry cannot walk alone. We need industry and society. And this is the point. We have to go further in putting technologies, operator, people, the human, uh, in, the whole, uh, in the whole loop, in the closed loop. And this is essential. Uh, and this is not new. This is what Japan is doing 10 years ago, more or less. So what we are doing in Europe is trying to follow uh, as much as possible what what the what Japanese are, are doing from a few years ago. Um, unfortunately, I would like to be sincere. This is not my concept. Uh, and indeed, uh, in this slide, there are three things that I would like finally to, to point out. First, that we need new modeling, control and optimization methods that are still required. Uh, but we need also more computation and communication resource. If we, if we see what uh, big companies like NVIDIA is doing at this moment, is, is, uh, is yes, we have a lot of very good sensors, very good perception system, but we need more computing power and we need more communication power. Secondly, artificial intelligence, my, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a magician, I'm, but uh, I, I don't have a, a, a bold to predict the future, but indeed, what, what I have discovered in my, in my more than 25 years working with artificial intelligence is that the, we will fail, definitely, because artificial intelligence itself, in engineering at least, needs something more that, than methods, need to be engineered. It's something that cannot be discarded. If we discard this, we are going to visit again 2001, I can remember in 2001 when I visited Robert Bosch uh, and Siemens, they didn't want to, to listen anything about artificial neural networks because they have failed in many of their projects. I'm talking about 20 years ago. Now we are going to enter in the same loop, basically because we are discarding systemic approach, we are discarding the physics, we are discarding what is really happening, the physics behind the system. This is not only about data. Data is one aspect, but we need, we need to deal with the physics. That what is happening? What is that the physics lo loss there? Finally, different views for synergetic approaches. Yes, we need multidisciplinary approach. We need synergetic approaches. And here there are three views depending on who, who is talking about. If I'm a robotic guy, I would like to say that Robotics and automation fueled by artificial intelligence, and my talk will be about that. If I'm a control guy, I say that hyper-automation driven by robotics and artificial intelligence. But if I'm artificial intelligence or data science, I would like to say that I tailor few shot everywhere artificial intelligence for robotics and automation. Fortunately, I'm not neither of one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adolfo, for your speech. Uh, do we have some questions to our keynote speaker? Please don't be shy. I know that you are after lunch. Okay, we have. I have one question. Autom uh, autonomous driving systems is uh, known maybe more than 10 years. Everybody trying to make some research and so on, but we didn't see on our street. Why? What is the problem? There are, there are two, two eventual responses to this question. The first one is that we are living the age of envelopes rather than the age of the contents. Uh, I would like always to, to resemble and to remember my professors the age 25 or 30 years ago in which the content is more important than to sell in the TV. And what we have hoping is the first explanation is that uh, they are selling in the TV things that are not working in the real life. This is one point. Secondly, is uh, the main technical challenge is indeed, it's not autonomous driving, is that 
Autonomous driving should live together with non-autonomous systems. And this is really, really challenging. We are not talking about a system with, in which all uh, automot automotive systems are autonomous. No, we are dealing with systems in which autonomous systems should also uh, live together with no autonomous. And this is, this is no an unsolved problem at, at this moment. Uh, because many legal issues have been solved, many, but indeed, 20 years ago, indeed, we, we started working on that. Uh, we did the first uh, 100 kilometers demonstration in Madrid in 2012. And the problem is that uh, it's not this, the problem is not to see a TV in, 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 in a freeway, a car, or, or, or a big a truck, uh, autonomous. The issue is that there are other, other cars that have to be together, and this is the, the, the technical constraint. And why? Because we are dealing with very many unpredictable physical systems, and this is something that takes, it can take some years, more than you expect, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Adolfo. Okay, we have questions from Professor Da Silva. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. I'm not from this field, but uh, I'm very impressed, and especially by the funding you get. You don't work with uh, projects which are less than 50 million euros, so I congratulate you. That's very good. Um, you said at the beginning um, that um, uh, in the past we worked with the physical laws and very little data. And nowadays it's exactly the opposite. It's a lot of data and just a few physical laws. Pardon me if I am controversial or ignorant, but um, I, I feel comfortable when uh, uh, we use uh, physical laws to predict uh, the future or, or some phenomena. We don't know that how they are going to happen in the future. And I feel much less comfortable when we use just data, past data, to, uh, to predict what will happen in the future with new data. Do you have a comment about this? Do you understand my, my point? Yes, I'm also belong to the old school, <laughs> but but the point is that uh, we are engineers. We have to find the trade-off. Trade-off means why to discard data if we have data, but why to discard physical laws if we know if we know that this system can be emulated by a tank, three tank system. Why not? I know the physical law. Why not to exploit it? The problem is that we are in our different studies in different universities. We are putting too much attention on simulation and we are losing the important attention on physics and dynamics of systems. And this is a problem because at the end we, we have excellent people that know how to program things in a, in, in an, on excellent way, but they don't know how to, to, to explain what is happening on the shadow. And this is the point. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some other question or questions. Please don't be shy, come on. It's a very interesting topic and presentation, so. Okay, if not, so thank you very much, Adolfo. It was a great pleasure to host you. Uh, and now we have a uh, next presentation from the uh, Beckhoff uh, company. Uh, this, will, this will be online presentation, yes? Remote? Yes, okay. Uh, okay, so this will be the remote presentation. So we have the guests from the industry, so the Beckhoff company. So please enjoy. Hi, good afternoon. I hope I all of you can understand me decently. I think I need to turn down my speakers a little bit because I'm hearing myself too good. Um, my name is Felix Schulte. I'm from Back of Automation. We are a West Salian company, so we are sitting in the West.
scientific and industrial contexts. And maybe I can try to touch upon a couple of these topics in my presentation as well. Originally, it was designed to give you an idea what backoff is and what the Xplanar system, the levitating transport system is. But I hope um, maybe we can touch upon these scientific aspects of the product as well. Because we very much like to see ourselves as a pragmatic science company. So we try to take inventions from the market and um, develop products uh, based on this. And this is pretty much what we have done with the Xplanar as well. Before we dive into the Xplanar, very short information about back of automation. So we are a company with 5,000 employees. Um, we have, uh, yeah, we are very head heavy to say how we say it in German. So this means we have roughly 2,000 engineers which are working in sales, which are working in development, which are working in support. Um, we have 24 businesses in Germany, 40 international daughter companies, one of them being Bank of Poland with, I think, more than 30 employees. Um, and we are represented uh, in more than 75 countries all over the world. Last year, we managed to jump over the 1 billion euro turnover mark and may achieved a uh, yeah, global turnover of 1.182 billion euros. Um, and we are doing this with automation technology. And when we say automation technology, we, un we understand with this term everything which is inside in a machine, in a production machine to make this machine run. Um, this starts with the PC, which is at the very core of our philosophy. So we have a PC which controls all the things which happen in a machine, which, um, yeah, gets the data from the sensors and calculates based on the SPS or the PLC program what needs to happen next. We have the IOs, so the uh, digital in and outputs, the analog in and outputs to collect the data from the machine and to send the data into the machine. We have this in different form factors. That's the yeah, biggest portion of our business. And we have for sure drive technology, so, rot so rotary motors. Um, and um, all of this is brought together by our software. So we have a huge software development team, which also focuses, for example, on using AI in an industrial context or in an automation context and many other things. So classical PLC development, HMI development, um, development for robotics and um, MATLAB integration and all of these things are available here just got the information that there was bad audio from my side. I hope this will improve. Okay, I'm asked to stop my presentation. I hope that the quality gets better now.
capacity to produce more uh, products per hour or per minute. Uh, and with this uh, four high runners, they have. I'm looking for the button that is here. Okay. So the the most impressive was like the 30 percent, uh, the, the 30 uh, percent growth, 35 percent growth. But actually, they overall, when they asked, they, when when they were calculating uh, the whole portfolio of products, they achieved around 12 percent uh, output gain. What does it mean, 12 percent output gain? It means a quarter of million pieces more per month. So imagine that out of nothing, without any additional investment, because you are just uh, saving the time the line is producing, you can produce uh, a quarter of million of products more. So that's uh, one of the reasons why they enter in depth with us uh, in further implementing of the, of the solution that, that we are providing. So what does it do? Because uh, that's actually the most important thing. So we are building the digital twin. There are different digital twins. Uh, when you take the Siemens software or when you take the, the FlexSIM, you just build the representation of the line with all the technical parameters and it's uh, really cumbersome and it takes a lot of effort and you really have to be uh, very uh, precise. It's, 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 like a, it's, it's, it's like always with the model. Uh, so when you, when, when you take physics, then you have uh, different models describing the world, you make some uh, shortcuts, you don't really completely describe the world, so it means that sometimes you might have a different uh, results. They are that, that are that are estimations. So what we are basing on, we have taken the, the very simple model which gives the representation of each and every machine with the counters, with a lot of parameters behind that. We are not trying to represent how do they look like, but how do they really work. So we were measuring how, how so we were measuring how do they really work and then moving along this chain of machines it's very flexible you can you you can put them as you want you have a different workflows you can uh, switch the, between one workflow to an, to another workflow depending on what products are you are you manufacturing so then we were uh, just looking at how the product flow is going there and we were looking for the bottlenecks, I will talk about it later, and we were talk looking about the root causes of the failures because sometimes something failed not on, uh, of, on, 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 on that machine, for example, but it's failing because something happened here on this machine. And that's very important to understand what are the, the root causes of different failures on the production lines. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to really understand it, but um, uh, then we have the video and the, and the image recognition as the eight. So what we do then, we just show, we just show uh, how statistically such line works. This is of course splitted by a different machines, by a different states. I will, I will tell a few, few, few words about it later. And then we have a lot of analyzers that helps to really dig deep into the data to understand what's the major reason of uh, failures. Uh, why the line is producing slower or why the line is stopping. Is it the issue because we have some uh, major failures with the machines or are we talking about the micro stoppages? We do not recognize them quite often because it's like a one, two, three seconds, but uh, along the production day it may sum up to like an hour or even two hours of these small micro stoppages that uh, are the space for saving. So what we do next there, uh, when we have some of the issues that are hardly recognizable, so you don't really observe the line as, uh, as, uh, as it works 24 by 7. So what we do, we put the cameras and when we have some issues that are, that are detected, uh, you can see and look with your own eyes or with the techni technician eyes and understand why the product is not being produced the way you want to uh, have it produced. That's the, that's the issue with the two robotic arms. They were putting the bottles from the conveyor belts uh, uh, into these holders and um, the issue was that the one of them was starving, the second one was uh, working uh, correctly. And, they, and, and, and it happens, depending on the different formats, sometimes it happens, sometimes, sometimes it's not. So when they start observing that, then they uh, understand what really happened and they can 
tweak the speed of the belt to have uh, the even distribution of the bottles and then to have the smooth production on the line. Uh, um, Okay, and that's and this is something that is uh, mm, what you can see with your own eyes. But what we can do and what we are doing right now in the different scenarios, we are applying the uh, different uh, image recognition and actually the video recognition methods. Some of them, most of them, are based on the AI and and and, and uh, uh, su supervised learning, where uh, the system can detect such issues uh, by its own. Why? because it's much more efficient and much cheaper than putting a lot of sensors here to understand what really happened. Uh, what we do more, uh, we of course can observe the energy uh, consumption or a different media consumption and then from the patterns of the energy consumption, uh, can be, the pattern of the energy consumption can be used for, and it's actually being used for the maintenance uh, processes. Why? Because when you have some issues with the machines, then you have some uh, variations in the consumption, uh, in the con in the energy consumption profile. And then when you start, and when we start detecting these anomalies, we can just raise the flag and say, okay, this machine is still working okay, but it may cause a potential problem in the new year future. And this actually leads us to self-learning factory uh, project. This is what this is the project that we have grant from the EU, and uh, we are just building this data science method for uh, for this. There are like the multiple things. One of them are for the predictive maintenance when we are looking at the the single machines. Some of them are looking at the line as such, and uh, why? Because uh, the most important things that people want to reduce are the bottlenecks. The bottlenecks are the machines that are the slowing the whole production process down. Uh, there are multiple methods how to uh, look and understand and find the bottlenecks. Some of them are the like the old schools, so you do the simulations or the analytical engine, or you do the simulations using the, the, the systems I mentioned before, and they are very, very time consuming. Uh, what we do right now, we are basing on the data, because we are living in the world of data. There is the IoT, there is a lot of data going on. The issue is how to take the information out of this data. So we are focusing like uh, on these two types of methods. One are the buffer observation methods. So it means that we are looking how the buffer is being filled and how the buffer is being empty before and after machines. And this gives us the indication, the potential indication of the the bottlenecks, so the machines that are the slowing the whole production process down. Uh, there are two ways. There are there are there are two ways, like the average waiting time. So how much in average the products are waiting before the machine, and uh, and there is the inter arrival time. So we are looking for the variation here. The more variation it is around the machine, so it means that the more the more probable is that the, that this machine is the bottle, bottleneck. Then there is the machine state observation. We have a lot of data and a lot of information about machine states. There are multiple states that machines are being described in this uh, consumer package type of productions. Uh, there is the language called PACML and uh, it describes the different states of the machines. And then we understand which, or which, which machines are starving and which, uh, and which machines are uh, stopped or flooded. So, uh, what do we do? We are looking for uh, the active period. So, it means how machine is uh, working. Okay, I will show it a little bit later. And then the arrow method, which is, uh, which is a different method that shows uh, that, that is moving from the, the starving machines to the, to the machines that are flooded with the uh, product. Uh, the, the shifting bottleneck is the, it's something which is uh, connected with the active period. It's uh, when you have the forked or merged uh, lines. So, uh, what do we do here? Uh, what do we do here with, this, uh, with the machine states? So, we are looking on the active, uh, active uh, state of the machine. So, if the machine is producing or potentially could produce, but maybe there is a, a failure, so it means that, the, that this machine is active. 
And then there is the inactive time, so it means that the machine is waiting for the products or uh, it's waiting for another, because, because it's starved, it doesn't have any products coming in, or the machine cannot, uh, it, it has to stop because the buffer is overflown uh, downstream the production line. And then when we take the average, uh, when we take the average as a time or as the, as the percentage, it means that it's very likely the it's very likely the machine that is uh, that that creates the bottleneck uh, on the line. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what's very important about this? Okay, what's not not, not very important? What's uh, 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 what you have to remember when we are looking at this method? We have to have some historical data. The more historical data we have the more accurate this method is. So quite often uh, it's like the old school way, the people are doing that on paper, observing the machines, uh, uh, noting the time, but, it will, but, it's, but, but, but then you have the offline uh, results. Then, uh, then uh, we are going to the, another method, it's the arrow, arrow method. Arrow method is that you are moving from the uh, that you are moving the vectors, or building the vectors from the blocked to the uh, starved result. So how much time the machine was blocked and how much time the machine was starved. So uh, and then you have uh, the arrow hats and the arrow hat in, it comes from the from the higher to the lower. And then most probably the bottleneck is the machine when these two arrows are coming together. Sometimes this is the arrow that, that is going to the first machine. Uh, and this also, and th this one, uh, this one requires the observation of the of the buffer and the data from the from the buffer regarding the starved and uh, the blocked machines. Uh, the next uh, method, the one that we are uh, applying right now, is the, it's the combination of the two, two previous methods actually. So it's the combination of the observing uh, of the observing the buffer. So we just say that when the buffer is between zero to twenty-five, so it means that the machine is starved or or or, 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 or is about to being starved, and then we have the buffer that is. Uh, the high, so 27 to 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 100 percent. You can change this. You can change this uh, uh, numbers, of course. So it means that uh, this machine, uh, so that this machine is blocked because because it cannot give any output. And by combining these two things, so estimating the the size of the buffer, ob observing the size of the buffer, and uh, combining it with the states of the machines, how uh, in, in which state the machines are, we can uh, easily understand which are the potential uh, bottlenecks. We can do it much precisely because observing the buffers give us uh, the indication in the real time, but uh, when we are building the data along the production, uh, uh, along the, the, the order being processed, then we have more and more accurate indication and this is the real time uh, indication. So, um, Basically, that was just a sneak peek into the, the one of the ways that we have in the system. And uh, we are offering and we are implementing this solution into multiple factories right now in the CPG uh, customer space. Why? Because it can help them to really uh, improve the efficiency in the short time. And, that was, and, that, and this is proven by the multiple customers. The second thing is that they start basing on the assumptions, but they can base on the real-time monitoring and with some video support when it's needed. It's much easier just to take the, the short videos when the machine had a failure, uh, have the understanding from the PLC controllers what was the type of the failure and then send it to the company that was supplying you with the machines. It's much easier than to describe it by humans who haven't seen this uh, uh, actually in fact. And that's a, like a kind of the umbrella that you can easily plug and play since this is the uh, cloud solu cl cloud-based uh, solution. Uh, a short sneak peek into what it really does. So it uh, gives the overview of the, all the factories. You can go down into the factory, see all the lines. Then you can go into the line and see how the line is, uh, how the line is wor working. Then you go into the uh, the work spectrum, so you can see how each how the whole 
production line is, going, is, is working. You can see how each machine is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is working. You can see the efficiency of the machines and if you have some stoppages, outages, uh, you have the indication what is the, the potential, uh, the root cause of the stoppage of the production. And of course a lot of uh, uh, reports that you can base on the, in the offline mode to understand your historical uh, data. Who is benefiting the most? Everything who has the consumer package goods type of uh, production. Mostly water, beverage, uh, the food, chemicals, up to the electronics. These are, mo these, these are, these are mostly the customers that we are uh, selling and implementing this solution. Uh, we have uh, a lot of partners from the uh, companies who are building the uh, CPG uh, production lines. And we have some partnerships with some technical university developing the AI methods for the uh, automated uh, looking for the root causes or, 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 or identifying bottlenecks or the image recognition uh, to see what's going on the production line just, just looking at the cameras. So basically that's everything from my side. So what we are here, we are looking also for partners and more partners from the, the science world and we are looking for the students to work for us. Thank you. Thank you very much for interesting presentations. And of course, uh, maybe we have some questions or maybe somebody want to work in this company. Okay, Professor Maki. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, I have uh, two questions, basically, but probably more. First of all, uh, uh, of course, uh, you are using this uh, in improvement cycle for the performance improvements. Uh, I, I was curious about uh, the periodic period you are using for monitoring, because this probably depends on the industrial processes. This is the first question, uh, because I guess that also the different methods you are suggesting, like active method or others, uh, may require some transient. On the other side, you have the characteristic of the industrial process and so on. Second is more in relationship to your, uh, in the concluding remarks, you were summarizing and fact-based uh, decisions uh, through the computer vision, hmm? the, the vision uh, you, you give in uh, just to discover the root causes and so on. Uh, this seems to me uh, a challenging uh, scope because uh, at the end uh, is also requiring the knowledge from people. Before we were talking about cognit cognitive consideration, about understanding the, what is happening in the physical system. So uh, my question in this, uh, as far as I understood, uh, is uh, uh, of course uh, you can habilitate uh, uh, to look uh, to the uh, current process, uh, but there is also a need to store the knowledge of people uh, along the time because uh, you know the continuous improvement brings to this knowledge that should be stored. The, my challenge, I think, the challenge I would like to consider is also this capability to store knowledge from people a long time. I hope it's clear. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for the questions. So, uh, like, these are two, two, two questions. So, one is uh, uh, how fast this cycle is, uh, okay, and the second is about the storing, uh, store, storing the, 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 the human knowledge. So, okay, from my perspective, this is so obvious that I sometimes to forget to mention. So this is the real-time uh, uh, solution. So it means that we are uh, collecting the data from the machines, depending what type of the machines and so on and so forth, in the real-time or, or the near real-time. We have multiple methods to connect to the machines. So, uh, and, then we just grab, and then we just grab the data and al analyze the data on the fly and the results in the real software, if we will have more time and the better connection I was trying to connect here, I can show it in the, like the, uh, up, the real application connected to some of the sample customers. 
So we are uh, generating the data uh, like the every few seconds here. And uh, so, okay, okay it's, it's actually being collected in the real time, then it's being pushed into the packages to, uh, to the cloud, then it's being analyzed, so you have the results every few seconds, actually. So that's like the, uh, the, 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 the question number, number one. And how do we collect the data? Through the PLC, fr from the PLC controllers, if there are the older type of the machines, we collect the data from the uh, we collect the data from the uh, like the counters or the photo cells or some different measuring devices like the energy meters. You have the backhoff here. One of our implementation is with backhoff actually. So there are so so there is so there is like indirect uh, current uh, measurement using the backhoff, and then we have the profile of the consumption, and then uh, having some algorithms implemented, we un we can understand. Uh, in what state and how the machine is really manufacturing, taking their, uh, their production cycle and so on and so forth. So that's like the answer to the question number one. Is it uh, enough from your perspective? Okay. The question to the number two, it's uh, easy and complicated. So for, first of all, this is what I haven't shown here, but uh, when we are looking at what we are doing, so it, it, it goes like that. We take the data, we collect the data, we give the, the information about the failure, root causes of the failure, but then you have the interaction with the personnel. So uh, the personnel, like the operator, has the information that this is this type of failure. He may, uh, okay, and then there are multiple ways how to operate it, but I will just give you one of the examples. Then, then he said, okay, I do agree with that. I said, I don't agree with that. So he can pick from the list that we built jointly with the customer to give uh, the, the different reason. Then the system learns that when he has such uh, the parameters, probably there is a different reason. Then, then you have the hints. So if there are the hints connected to, to, to the reasons, then the operator has the information about what to do to, uh, uh, to deal with the, the situation, actually. And then... If you enter the data there, so the system learns, and then he preserves the knowledge, and so on and so forth. So this is how, more or less, does it, uh, does it go? Uh, what, more, what, what more should I else, uh, what should I else add here? Yeah, okay, okay, so everything, everything can be predefined, or you can type it from the, uh, just from the keyboard, and so on and so forth. So there is like the multiple ways of doing that. And then regarding the computer vision, so, uh, so we have the data science team, which is uh, uh, in the project, working on uh, uh, then a different aspects. We are, we are we're trying with this. Uh, we are not, not actually trying. This is this is what we are doing with this uh, uh, self-learning factory. We are, we are building like the library of the digital representation of a different genotypes of the machines, like you have uh, the machine that is pouring the, uh, the water or any liquid to the, to the bottles, there are like the few types in the world. So we are building them with the set of the data you should, you should uh, collect from this type of machines and uh, algorithms behind that, that helps you to understand what the state of the machine is and uh, so, okay, in what state does it operate and what's the, the state of the machine as such. And then again, having the uh, the, the mostly the mostly the al algorithms that are looking for uh, um, anomalies. We are we are uh, we are detecting or, or, or giving. So, uh, we are building something like the health factor of the machine. So it means that the more accidents there are, uh, or the the more the, the frequent accidents there are, or the stoppages, then it means that that the health factor of the machine is going down. That's that that's basically how does it how does it go. And then uh, there are some, like, like the built-in models. So when you have the, the, the machine that is like screwing the bottles, uh, we are looking, so, so we have the model built, which gives you uh, what's, the, uh, what's the condition of the rubber, of, of the rubber in, the, in, this, in, in, in this holder here. And then as the hint, we can give the operator the information that approximately in 15 minutes or half an hour, this will be worn off and then you will have the stoppage because of that. So they can in advance prepare the uh, spare parts and switch it uh, when, it's, when it's needed. So they save like a half an hour of the production time. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Other questions? Adolfo, please. 
Unfortunately, I'm pretty well aligned with Professor Marco Macchi. My question, I will say in, in another way, do you, really, do you think that there is still a gap in a way of which uh, systems are now a days providing in useful insights about what is happening or uh, smart recommendations? In other words, how the data is being exploited once beyond data recording or simple stats? The question is, uh, okay, the, nowadays there are, in the market, we can find different solutions for monitoring, for metering, for visualization. Uh, but beyond that means uh, it's difficult to find the market's uh, products or solutions that provide in useful insights for technologies or for, or for about the data, about what should be done or, or uh, what should not be done in relation with this. Uh, so do you consider that this, this is still a gap uh, and to refine products or to do something more else? Thank you very much for the question. I, okay, I, I think I do understand. So uh, the answer is a uh, very simple yes. I still believe that there is a gap and what, what we found out actually is that, okay, because it comes from the simple OEE monitoring. This is the golden OEE, everybody wants to know what are they OEE, they are taking some data and blah, 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 blah. First of all, most of them are the offline solutions so they know the OEE to some extent in the some, uh, some amount of time. There is more and more the, uh, the live system like ours showing the OEE in the real, in the real time, okay. That's, that's, that, that's perfect, but we have never seen, okay, we have seen very few at the very early stage, the solutions that are focusing on finding the bottlenecks or finding the root cause of the, of the, of the issues. So I think that this is the gap and there are like, I, I can mention like the few other, uh, a few other solutions av available worldwide. Most of them are, uh, mm, uh, they started as a startup like us and they are being purchased by the companies like the Wonderware and so on and so forth. But we are talking about like the three, maybe four type of the solutions. Some of them are very expensive, some of them are very inaccurate because they are the big gorillas right now. Okay? So that's, uh, we are, I think that we are much more agile and much more flexible. So I still think that there is a need and there is a gap for such, such, such solutions. And it helps us to win the really, really large customers like the global pharmaceutical customers or the global cosmetical companies. I'm not talking about the one production line somewhere in Poland. I'm talking about the, the whole factories worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions before the coffee break? Just a short comment. <laughs> <laughs> discussion with you. No, uh, I was attracted by your, uh, your answer about uh, the few solutions that uh, are able to provide uh, such a kind of capability to follow the dynamics, uh, because at the end it's also related to the dynamics on the whole line, on the whole production system. That, that is the point, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a really clever idea to, to cover this gap, uh, because uh, uh, I, one of my preferred book, uh, is an American book from uh, Professor Hope and Spearman, which talks about factory physics, which deals uh, with a kind of matter, with different methods. It was written some years ago, but it has a lot of principles in regard to this uh, uh, bottleneck shifting uh, according to the dynamics. Then, moving the factory physics idea to the operation requires uh, methods that uh, can adapt. Uh, and I, I understand that also this may depend on the changing of the mix, uh, of the production mix, uh, changing of the processing requirements. So basically the variability you may have from operations. Uh, and I think it's a challenging uh, consideration. So I'm really, it was just more a comment rather than a question, but just to confirm uh, that it's uh, really interesting. About, about the different methods that we are using. Actually, some of them they are, they are based like 
uh, I don't know, 20 years ago from the automotive industry, where people were going with these cars, with the, with the charts, they were marking that, and of course they had the results uh, two days later. And the same situation was actually with AI. Uh, when, when we have the discussion about, uh, okay, but can you achieve it differently? I said, yes, I can. I can put one people, one man, in front of every machine, he will, be, uh, he will be marking everything and then we will have these results. But the issue is that I have to put a few hundred people along the production line. I cannot afford that. No, no, I'm, 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 <laughs> no the, the, this is interesting, I think that we can follow because we are on the time constraint during the coffee break. But indeed, I, my, my point is, indeed, we have big players, but we have thousands and thousands of small SMEs that cannot afford uh, many of these solutions due to the cost. Indeed, this is not the same for... We want to provide solutions that indeed can be affordable uh, and indeed can exploit. Because indeed, if you are an owner of SMEs, or manufacturing SMEs, you don't want to that anyone put hands on your process. You want to reserve this rights to you. But at the same time, you need something to provide some useful recommendations and, and, and so on. So, yeah. yeah. So when we are talking about the prime phone factor, we are talking about 50 bucks per machine per month. And the production line, typical production line is 6 to 12 machines. We can combine some of them because we do not really un need to understand how, to, how, how, how are they uh, constructed. But we are, but we are. What we are concerned is about the signals from them and about the the production, the workflow that, that, is, that is going there. So the products coming in and the products coming out, the components coming in and coming uh, and the components coming in as well. So a different types of uh, scenarios that we are covering, like we are predicting when some of the components will be uh, gone. So again, you will have the hint to bring the components to the production line early enough not to stop the production and so on. And these are all these micro stoppages for a few seconds that can save you really, really a hundreds or thousands, or hundreds of thousands uh, on the monthly basis. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much for, uh, for, for the discussion, but <clears throat> I must stop this very nice conversation because we have a very, very yes, coffee break and delay, but uh, before the coffee break, I must very warmly welcome uh, the specific guest, special guest. It's a distinguished guest, so this is the vice rector of our university, Professor Renata Walczak, so please very warmly welcome this guest. So it's an incredible pleasure that uh, such uh, authority of our university find the time to be here with us. So I think this is the also great surprise for you and for me. So I think it's worth to stay after the break with us uh, because maybe Vice Rector want to say a few words about the, this project and of course the, the, our university. So please, after the break, be here and uh, I think it will be still very nice presentations and conversations. So thank you very much and the, the, the coffee break is of course in the same room like lunch and the previous breaks. Panie, który jest bardzo zainteresowany.
Welcome everybody. After the uh, last coffee break, so we have uh, two more presentations for today, and then of course a very short summary, because I know that we are all tired, but thank you that you are here and of course you survived this long uh, day. But before our uh, next keynote speaker, distinguished guest, uh, Francesco de Lisola, will present, so maybe I will uh, give the floor for our distinguished guest from the highest authorities of our university, so uh, Professor Renata Valczak, Vice Rector of uh, our university, and maybe uh, she won't say a few words about IPA project, which she is involved, uh, very, very hard working, of course, in this project, and she won't also share with you a uh, request for uh, realizing the, the research which she conducted. So, Professor Valczak, please, if you can say a few words. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank warmly Dean Tomek, thank you, and Professor Eismond, who invited me to taking part in the project IPAE. Uh, I tell the truth, I cooperate with most of you. We uh, prepared a questionnaire in 13 languages and I would like to ask you for uh, filling this questionnaire. Now we have two persons from each country, so it's too small. I expect I beg to fill <laughs> the questionnaire and I would like to give floor to more distinguished guests Francesco de Lisola, so thank you so much for being here. I'll be uh, during dinner so we can talk about everything. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, I uh, believed to have uh, more time, but I squeezed my presentation. I, I need to thank uh, the Dean, Professor Chemleski, I'm sorry, Polish is a big problem for us. And uh, I will try to discuss uh, some concepts before showing you some interesting results, uh, results which may be of interest in applications. By the way, I was rather interested by our colleague from Porto, for instance, and I will try to connect also to some uh, other uh, presentations I've seen before, for instance, uh, digital image correlation. The problem which uh, we are facing uh, in, in this moment in mechanics, I, I am a mechanician, a physicist involving, involved in mechanics, uh, many years ago, uh, many others claimed that mechanics has nothing to give us anymore, that you simply need to find some constitutive equations and uh, the job is ended, actually. Exactly when they said this, uh, the theory of metamaterials started and a dramatically complicated problem arise, uh, which is of great importance in engineering applications, and not only. The problem is the following. I dream, as we say in Italian, I wake up one morning and I have a vision. I want a material doing something, okay? Then my problem is, is this material possible? And how can I build it? So this is the problem of synthesis of metamaterials. So, given the properties, to find a material which behaves in the way in which we prefer, which we desire. Now, mathematically speaking, this is a terrible problem. It is a problem of higher uh, difficulty than the others uh, studied in the first half of 20th century. The reason is that Usually, you have a piece of metal, and then you look for the equations governing the motion of this piece of metal. Now, we have the equations. And we must find a material governed by these equations. 
So it is a very uh, challenging problem. However, if you go and read in the books, you discover that this is not a new problem. Uh, you know, generally, I, have, I am from South Italy, so uh, <clears throat> I talk very often about Greek mathematics. But this is not Greek mathematics. This is mathematics of uh, 40s, 50s of 20th century. Somebody here is old enough as I am to remember that before digital computers, we were using analog computers. So you had some equations and you wanted an electric circuit governed by your equations. This is an analog computer. What you see here is the synthesis which I performed in order to design a piezoelectromechanical material, which is a metamaterial in which the vibration energy of a plate is transformed into electric energy via piezoelectric transformers. And this is the scheme of a, an element of a Kirchhoff plate. Why? Because we have proven that in order to have the maximum of transfer of energy, the electric circuit must be the analog of the mechanical system you want to damp. So, you must study the books. Think about it. The books of the 40s where they were uh, learning and teaching how to synthesize circuits in a different, and apply these results in a completely different context. You have the equations of a metamaterial and you want to find the microarchitecture which has to be uh, at the basis of this novel mechanical, uh, novel mechanical problem. I will give you only one example of a synthesis problem which I have solved here in this faculty. Uh, uh, Professor Lekchiski, another way for not reading, you know, I, I don't know how to pronounce um, uh, Polish words. I think you have more sounds than Italian. This is the problem. Anyway, with Tomek, but you know here telling Tomek is dangerous. We have also the Dean. With Tomek, we, we worked on the problem of finding a material which elongates with zero or very low deformable energy. So we wanted a material which remained in the elastic regime uh, in, in the range of large deformations. Okay, so this, this problem, now the equation you see here is the equation describing the um, elongation, the bending energy and the shear energy of some beams. This is the energy, the deformation energy of the novel, what we called pantographic plate, which we were imagining to have. Now, together with Pierre Sepecher and Tomek, we decided to use this microstructure which is a pantographic structure, and to build a material having a microstructure constituted with this uh, pattern. Uh, this was a dream when we published this paper. We mathematically have proven that this energy you can get combining suitably this, this microstructure. So, in a sense, I have a standard material, even isotropic, okay? I form microstructures with this standard material and homogenized at a macro level, this microstructure produces this crazy energy which I was dreaming at the very beginning, okay? What happened? Okay, of course, uh, somebody having some experience in structural engineering, we recognize here the Warren Bridge microstructure. If you place a pantograph at the top of it, you find a new beam, a beam whose deformation energy depends on the third 
derivative of transverse displacement. So generalizing Euler, Bernoulli, beam theory. But what we uh, imagined was to have these pandographic beams vertical and horizontal. And if the pivots which we are introducing are perfect, all these deformations you see in this plot are with zero energy. So what we are getting is something which elongates without deformation energy. Of course, you can add some deformation energy, adding some suitable elastic elements. So you can play with optimization to get exactly what, what you want. OK, but it is due to uh, Tomek Leszczynski to imagine that we could start printing simplified pantographic structures like this one using 3D printing. When somebody talks about European Union, he should think that European Union is that beautiful thing which gives the money here in Warsaw and allows me to come from Rome or L'Aquila and to work with colleagues here using the machine paid by European Union. Okay, so before talking, we are earning a lot from, from this, but okay, this is politics. Now, if you want to study a single pantographic beam, and again, these measurements were made in Berlin, you discover that you, you can have beams behaving like that in shear remaining in the elastic regime. Now, I will try to show you a nice numerical simulation. Okay, this, it is too quick. Okay, this behaves like a, a beam. You are imposing a displacement in the center and the force goes up linearly. Then, you have a saddle point, a phase transition, and it behaves like a cord. So this material has this peculiarity. With small displacements in the middle, it is like a beam, and for larger deformations imposed in the center, it is like a cord. Okay, this is a very exotic behavior. Okay. Then, and this is again printed in this uh, faculty, we printed the pantographic sheet, which in this moment is being tested again in Berlin. So I will give you, if you invite me next time, I will give you the results of this. But in order to develop the mathematical model for this complex structure, remark that here you have perfect pivots printed. Uh, I have visited many institutions around the world. Let me tell you that the only place where I could get perfect pivot printed is this faculty. Now some Germans in Freiburg are trying to do it for metal uh, 3D printing, but I, I have not yet got a specimen in my hands uh, uh, doing this, this nice. Of course, I met in a conference Anil Misdra, and he agreed with me that we needed to study pantographic modules in detail so that we decided to print again here and he visited this faculty uh, at least two times and in Kansas University having a, 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 an experimental apparatus being capable to measure tens of Newton, we could, for this structure, prove this nice behavior, which I will try to describe you via these plots. You have different specimens, and you have different height and, height and diameter of the pivots interconnecting. So I'm talking about this small pivots interconnecting different beams. And what we have discovered is that for B2 uh, kind of pantographic modules, 
you get a maximum of exerted force for a given displacement. So what you have? Changing less than 1% of the volume of your material, of the mass of the material you are using in your microstructure, you can dramatically change the macroscopic overall performances of your specimen. These critical phenomena are of great importance in, in engineering applications. Now, I, I, I show you something which may be of great interest. Uh, this is a block made of pantographic sheets, and what I'm showing you are elastic deformations. When this blade comes up, the material comes back straight. Okay? Now, to study what happens in this material, I found an agreement with Ecole Normale Supérieure de Paris Saclay, the, the old Cachan, and I, I will show you and I will describe you what is that. This is the deformed shape of a pantographic block as measured with a X-ray machine which plays the specimen inside a box and turns slowly the specimen showing everything inside. There is a A4 sensor which is behind a scintillator and the X-ray source is producing the, the, the energy needed for reading. Look, you can go inside the specimen. You can, do you see these black, blacker spots? There, the material is denser. So this, this uh, kind of investigation allows us to understand in great detail what is happening in this, in this specimen. This specimen has a deformation which everybody who has studied Saint-Venant theory of beam, anticlastic deformation, okay, this is not doing anything like that. Okay, there is zero Poisson effect, for instance, and you have, and I will show you in the next part of the movie, you have a, an arch effect, which is very positive. Look, the, the cut. Okay, all these beams are supporting the deformation. The bottom is straight, so the bottom is not receiving any load. This material manages to distribute the load from the top on the wings and the bottom is protected. I recently presented this result in Paris and um, an American from the defense was present. He wants to use this for designing a material protecting from uh, impacts. Okay, but I think that maybe we can try to develop these things here. Look how beautiful is this technology. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody this morning has shown us the uh, image recognition of some objects. I think that with this device you can do wonderful, uh, wonderful experiments and you can understand beautiful uh, effects and prove that your equations are working rather well. Okay, but I have time limits, so I proceed and I show you, because you must be very proud of your people here, uh, uh, this is the unique pivot. You know, I could not patent, we could not patent this because somebody had written a paper imagining how to do this. Okay, this is the only way, the only, uh, um, this faculty is the only institution where this 3D printing uh, is possible. In France, they tried to do in metal, 
and they are very upset because they did not manage to do something like that. So I offended them telling, okay, I will go in Germany. So they are working a little bit in competition. Uh, these uh, metallic specimens were printed in Paris and look, this is the kind of deformations which you, you can observe in non-perfect pivots. These are pictures are showing you the detail of the granular structure of polyamide uh, materials. And then, again, European Union. I discovered that in Crete, they got from Europe uh, a lot of money for uh, a device which is uh, described on the left, which is capable to do 3D printing at the level of micrometers. So I, printed, I asked to have printed these specimens which you can see there. They are 20 micrometers, smaller than 20 micrometers. And we measured the mechanical response of this in Berkeley. Because you know, the indenter which is needed for measuring these things is another thing which is very expensive. So we sent these specimens from Crete to uh, Berkeley and exactly the same mechanical behavior observed in millimetric pantographs has been observed. What, why I am so interested in this? We can build a tissue whose fibers are micrometers thick, which behaves like the pantograph I've shown you at the beginning, elongating 40% of its length remaining in the elastic regime. There is only a small step in technology. We must print with the technology available in Greece, not only a small specimen, but a bigger tissue. Okay. Now, uh, do you remember that Le Verrier discovered Neptune uh, making a theoretical calculation and that after few years, other astronomers could see picture taken before Le Verrier in which Neptune was present. Without a theory, we are blind. Okay. After I have studied pantographic structure synthesizing them, a group in Sigan discovered that this effect is already present in fiber reinforced structures. And they could prove pantographic effects in something they had already studied many years ago. And the behavior of this uh, composite for them was mysterious. Okay. Okay. Now, before I end, I want to tell you that continuum mechanics is much more powerful than you expect. How do we got these equations? Actually, we started with this energy and, and we imagined this microstructure. Then we homogenized the deformation energy of this microstructure and we proved rigorously that this is the deformation energy which governs pantographic structures. Okay, now what is astonishing is, is this. This is wide knit cell. This is a little bit dense. This is denser. We expected that continuum mechanics were was valid only at this level. What happens is that continuum mechanics works very well also for this structure. So the reason for which we can get predictive, um, predictive uh, numerical simulations using continuum mechanics when the microstructure is so macroscopic is a subject to be investigated uh, mathematically with serious tools. By the way, 
when beams touch, you have another phase transition here. This material is not behaving anymore as a second gradient material, a material in which the formation energy depends on also on the second gradient of displacement. It comes back to be a first gradient material. So I suspect that we can study the properties of such dense neat material in more detail for discovering very interesting effects. Okay, this is for describing why pandographic structures show second gradient contributions. You have a beam and this beam is bent. And it is very well known that this is a second gradient energy appears in Euler beam theory. Okay, then, before I conclude, I must discuss the very nice effect of resilience which we get in the elongation of these pandographic specimens. In, you have an elongation of 40 millimeters for a specimen which is long 210. Uh, this is not the best, the, mm, the optimized um, specimen. We could get better. But anyway, at 20 millimeters, you remain in the elastic regime. This means that this specific metallic specimen can elongate 10% remaining in the elastic regime. But what is very useful, I, I think, for, from the experimental point of view, is this process of rupture. When parts of the structure start to be broken, the force exerted by the specimen increases. So when you are destroying a material, it is offering more and more resistance. If you calculate the area below this part of the plot, this is the energy needed for destroying the specimen. If you calculate the energy here, this is the elastic energy uh, which is used uh, by your system, you need much more energy for destroying it than for deforming it in standard exercise conditions. So this could be very precious in aeronautical engineering. I skip some of this. Uh, you, this is, somebody told me, okay, your material is working very well in extension, so we made shear deformations. Also, twist. I cannot show you because we didn't have, uh, we don't have yet the, the results. Uh, but um, we, we have very positive results for twisting. Okay, this superposition of colors obtained with numerical simulations and experimental measurements show you how careful second gradient, second gradient theories are. I must refer here that introducing a more sophisticated model, we can describe the rupture phenomena occurring in these in this, uh, pandographic structures. Uh, these are very nice. You see here it is broken and the beam is moved. Now, if you introduce a generalized uh, continuum model in which you have the placement of the upper layer of beams and the lower layer of beams, and you introduce an elastic energy describing the deformation of the pivot interconnecting them, you get that the, the concentration of deformation energy is in these crosses. And this gives you an idea of the fact that it is exactly here that the pivot is broken, or on the sides there. Okay, so a yield criterion can be formulated, which gives us the precise prediction of the modality of rupture of these specimens. 
Okay, okay, this is the picture of how it is broken sometimes. This is the deformation energy which we add. Next step. In the next two days I will be here and we will print a pantographic structure in which pivots have different stiffnesses. You have perfect pivots in the center, perfect clamping, 100 is perfect clamping there, and some less stiff pivots interconnecting the beams. Why we are doing this? Because this is our theoretical optimal specimen. This specimen, if we are right, can elongate 75% of its length remaining in the elastic regime. So if this prediction will be confirmed, then we can supply to engineers a material which has unbelievable properties. It nearly doubles its dimensions, remaining elastic. Okay, and this for somebody accustomed to standard materials is really, really unbelievable. Okay, let me, we have already spoken about uh, mod, continuum models, but I want to, to show you some nice image analysis. Okay, we made also experiments in dynamics, but we, we cannot do this. Uh, using, talk about this, using uh, the apparatus in paris Saclay, you have a big problem. You must follow the deformed shape of your material in large deformations. Digital image correlation software or digital volume uh, recognition uh, software is not capable to do this. So once more, I was very happy to contribute to experimental measurements with our theory. You know what we did? We invented a uh, volume correlation code, which goes to look for a part of the material where the theory predicts it should be. So what happens is that you, you help the software who is, which is uh, reconstructing the volume after the formation, telling him, look, this part in the reference configuration should be there. And it, it goes directly there looking for it. So uh, together with... Um, Francois Hild, we using this backtracking procedure, we could reconstruct in large deformations the shapes of, of our specimen. Of course, the one which I'm showing here is, is not so important. Remember the movie I've shown you before. That volume reconstruction is simply impossible with commercial software now, now av uh, available. Okay? You need that theory for being able to make this image uh, reconstruction. Okay, I conclude. This is the last slide. There was a big debate. Somebody told that I have a fixation with higher gradient continua and somebody told me Look, if you model with a standard Cauchy first gradient continuum at the level of 100 microns, your material, you get exactly the same predictions. And we made this investigation and it is true. But with the same computer, the same card, the simulation for using Second gradient continua lasts three minutes. If you use a first gradient continuum, which go and describes in detail what happens to every part of the, of the system, you need three millions of degrees of freedom and 
seven days of numerical simulations. The optimization is impossible. You cannot run 1,000 times a, 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 a code which needs seven hours. Okay. Again, probably artificial intelligence will replace us and so human beings will be able to enjoy life without inventing mathematical models. I believe, however, that I will not see it in my life. Maybe we will need some extra generations. But hypothesis non fingo, as said Newton. I don't try to give you hypothesis. Okay? Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Delisola. It was a great speech and I loved your enthusiasm. So it's, I know that you are a world expert in this field. It was heard and it was very inspiring. So maybe we have some questions to our distinguished guest. Okay, Professor Da Silva. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating uh, presentation. You, you mentioned that uh, uh, you met some Ameri Americans that are interested in using uh, this for uh, structures and their impact and I, I uh, reinforce that. I think that would be a very good idea. The automotive industry, I'm sure, would be very interested. But, um, uh, and yes, yes. But the, 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 um, the situation you will have is that the, the structure will be mainly loaded in compression. So my, idea, my question is, uh, all this study that you have shown is mainly under tension. You said that you also tried shear. What do you expect under compression? Right. Uh, I, I, I decided, and probably I was wrong, not to show you some measurements we made in compression. Uh, it, it works very well. But you know, the three-point bending test is yeah, you have this principle. What happens in compression is something which we must understand. You don't have buckling like in beam, Euler beam. You have a buckling in the shape, in the barrel shape of the material. Sometimes you have only one wave. Sometimes you have two waves, depending on the parameters. So we are investigating this. Also, the twisting is, in this moment, I am trying to get out of my group the, the digital volume correlations for these two tests. And, but I must tell you that the mathematical model predicts exactly what it happens. So I'm, I'm optimistic about our capacity of exploiting this, this effect. Do we have another questions? Okay, the Dean. Professor De Isola, thank you very much for advertisement of, of our faculty. It's, uh, it's I appreciate, <laughs> appreciate it a lot. <laughs> thank you very much. Could you mention a little more about uh, application, about potential application? You, you mentioned about uh, protective of, uh, of uh, could you remind? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, we, how to say in English, we should not place limits to God's uh, uh, imagination. But I, I think that what we can do, for sure, uh, we can solve a problem in the uh, technology of airplanes. Why I'm telling you this? Because I was contacted by Safran. Uh, of course, they will use this idea themselves. Do you know that in the rotor of airplanes, they need to keep uh, the inner part at a higher pressure than outside? They need three atmospheres inside. They built a small layer of aluminum, and the blade, the first time moves, cuts inside this part. So our life is linked 
to the resistance of a thickness like that of aeronautical aluminum. If it moves, it goes away, the airplane falls down. If you remember some years ago, a lady from China has been seen throwing some coins inside a rotor, because this is good luck for China. <laughs> and this was the automatic way for dying immediately. And that plane needed to be dismounted completely for recovering the few coins she had thrown inside. Uh, I think that this material, which can double its dimension with a very low uh, external load, can do the job in a more reliable way. Then you must think about biomechanical and bi bio biomechanical applications. Uh, a small child who needs after uh, surgery, you place in his body a, 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 an artificial tube. Then the poor child grows. You need to go there and replace the tube. Unless it can be elongated easily, remaining in the elastic regime. Because you should know also something else. Our arteries are elastic and they contribute to the motion of blood. So you, you cannot be happy of a tube which is plastically deformed inside. So these are only few we should start thinking about applications. But I, I think that this specific uh, metamaterial may be uh, used in, in this way. Thank you very much. Do we have some other questions, comments maybe? Uh, I have questions. Are you using topological optimization, I mean computational method to create some structure? The optimization I presented to you at the end is a kind of topological optimization. So at the beginning you are creating some uh, theoretical research and then you can do topological optimization, right? that parabolic beams show some interesting effects optimizing buckling out of plane buckling, buckling which can be of use in, in, in this. So I I could make another presentation about it. But yes we, we are we are doing it. We are doing it. Thank you. Some, some other questions, questions comments Maybe Professor Rakshutsky won't add something to this interesting presentation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I, I can imagine. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Derisol. It was a great pleasure. Uh, and now we have uh, the last presentation for today, but I am more than sure that it will be very interesting because this will be presentation from the industry uh, side. So, uh, Mr. Sadowski and Mr. Waver uh, will present some applications. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much that you are with us, even if this is so late. You know, our presentation is maybe quite special. Uh, you know, the title is Industrial Deployment of Cloud-Based System. Uh, but, uh, but, but, I would like to, but I would like to highlight one thing. We are together. We are here with, uh, with Jacek. And uh, this is not only about deployment, this is not only about the technical things, but it's also about the good cooperation between our companies and this is about the good cooperation with uh, this faculty and uh, Warsaw University of Technology because we were connected because of this. Uh, so uh, in, in this presentation we would like to show you you know how we work on, on some some problem how we work together and we will give you you know uh, you know our way how we solve you know 
uh, some, some real problem in industry. So, uh, Jacek Wawer, uh, Wam Technik, and myself, Michał Sadowski from Attend uh, Industries, we will uh, show you our, our uh, solution. Good afternoon. This is uh, last presentation today that we will st uh, speak very fast because next point on the agenda is uh, dinner. Uh, and, and first, my name is uh, Jacek Wawer. I have to been working from uh, Wam Technik uh, since 2015. I charge of uh, CI and planning. Uh, activity, production planning. Uh, together with uh, Michal, we speak uh, a little bit about uh, introduction uh, cobots in our uh, production. I say a little bit from my side, it's a point of view as a user and investors. And Michal say uh, the story from the another point of view as a technology provider. Uh, we will see on the uh, end of presentation that the story uh, have a uh, happy ending uh, or no. Uh, how uh, everything was started um, on the beginning as a, a lot of companies, perhaps all of companies, we are looking for opportunities to increase quality and production efficiency. And in this point we focus on the low uh, volume uh, production because uh, Automatization in the low, uh, high, high volume mass production is uh, quite easy because we can buy machine uh, almost directly from the shelves, uh, where capacity of these uh, machines is, for example, uh, two cells per second. But if we talk about uh, low volume uh, produ production, this capacity it doesn't make sense because we kill them by changeovers. And uh, this is a challenge of this uh, uh, project. Um, as I mentioned, with low volume production, machine speed is no longer important. Uh, it's a first uh, flexibility of the solution. We're looking for a flexible solution adapted to rapid changes in the manufactured product. Uh, because we are uh, not only producer, but also the designer of the battery packs and we have a lot of products and the shape of this product is a quite, uh, quite different and uh, it's a, a lot of range of shapes uh, cell holders and of course uh, we looking for the possibility of covering the machine for completely different tasks because our um, our industry if we talk about battery producer now it's grow rapidly. We have a lot of new products. A lot of it's a startups. It's, it's a new product. We don't know how long this product will be uh, live in the markets. Maybe quite long, maybe short. And the first production is a very uh, low um, capacity, very low orders. And uh, after this uh, requirement, we choose one operation in our production. It's a sorting and putting cell, cells in the cell holders. Because it doesn't matter how this battery pack looks like, how it shapes and this half cover or without cover, this operation is always. On the beginning, we have to sort and put cells in the cell holders. Cell holders are the plastic elements which take care of uh, take care cells. Mm. And now we uh, show redesign of the battery packs assembly process. Uh, after chosen this uh, operation, we um, choose initial conditions, new requirements. Of course, uh, as I mentioned, we have short production orders very often the so pieces in this order is, uh, for example, 100 pieces only. This is not a mass production. Uh, many different products with different cell holder shapes. It's a very wide range of uh, shapes. Uh, we need to select cells in terms of voltage resistance and maintain full traceability. It's a very important from the uh, live battery and correct working of battery manager system, which battery uh, have to have 
inside computer which manage uh, this battery. Uh, we look a little bit from the, our workers because we want to eliminate monotonous a very and uh, repeatable operation as we put cell holders in the uh, cells in the cell holders i'm sorry it's a very repeatable and uh, very monotonous works uh, during a wire shifts operator have to put few thousand cells uh, of course reduction of production lead times and uh, machine changeovers this is a process how it look like uh, before a cobots implementation. First steps, of course, it's a, a storage, it's a mine warehouse where cells waiting for, for, for production. Uh, next step, it's a transport cells from the warehouse to the sortic machine. Sortic machine, it's uh, another uh, device production. Uh, this is uh, outside of the assembling line. And this, uh, mm, there are we are uh, sorting cells. This is, uh, should happen according to the production queue, because the sorting machine is a high capacity machines. It's uh, quite fast, and very often we have to shut down long order uh, sorting long order to sort short order and back to the previous uh, order. Uh, and in this uh, operation, we also um, have to take cells from the original uh, cartoons and uh, put it to the next cartoons, of, of course, mark, mark it uh, correctly and make all traceability. Uh, step four, it's a storage after sorting before a production. It's a middle storage. It's, a, of course, it's a MUDA. Uh, and next step is a transport to the assembly client and it's a main process, it's a produce of the battery packs and manual assembly in the cell holders according to documentation. Of course, from the each of these uh, steps, we have to um, collect data. This data is uh, storage on the, a lot of computers. These computers is a usual uh, part of the machines. It's a difficult to manage this data because we have to make backup from the few computers and when some happen with some computers, it's a lot of that data. Uh, and of course, on the assembling line, we use additional automatical visual systems uh, for checking that operator don't mistakes during uh, putting uh, cells into the cell holders. Uh, maybe you show because it's uh, important how uh, operators put the cells because sometimes it's a plus plus up sometimes minus up and this is pattern it's a qu sometimes very uh, difficult and operators should uh, have very attention during this uh, operation process after change uh, Three of the six uh, steps have been removed. The cells go directly from the mine warehouse to the assembly line. We are leaving out a large part of the internal transport. Of course, each internal transport is a MUDA from definition. Uh, internal operation storage is also MUDA and uh, uh, we short lead time in these this, this steps. Uh, of course, we don't uh, have to buy, uh, using, uh, manage uh, additional vision system to check that dead cells are assembled correctly. We have to know that this uh, visual system should be, of course, learned uh, and uh, maintenance by, by our people. And, of course, we eliminate the possibility of making mistakes during a storage, transport, marking, because who uh, make mistakes during a mark carton, uh, during a storage we have to some damage or something like that. And uh, now this process look like, like this uh, picture. It's a storage transport to the assembling line. Cobots make uh, all activity connected with sorting and putting all, uh, cells into the uh, cell holders. 
we have data only from one, pay, uh, one uh, places, only one computer, it's a cloud. Uh, and planning process is also easier because we're planning only one assembly line, not uh, a lot of uh, additional device. And of course, we have shorter production lead time, freeing the sorting machine from small production orders because we have there a lot of changeovers. Now we have focus on the uh, high volume production, uh, space saving, uh, because why we choose a cobot? Because cobots want to, it's able to work very close to operators, very close to people, without any cave, without any uh, owner protection, like, for example, light barriers or something like that. Of course, we have high flexibility and high production uh, quality, uh, no assembly uh, errors. And of course, one of the more important, if not the most important gains, it's uh, relieving people from the very repeatable and monotonous work. Uh, how is uh, inserting cells into the uh, cell holders? It's a thousand of cells during a one shift. Uh, of course, operators still working uh, in this assembly line, the station, but he can focus on the, um, another uh, task. Yeah, so uh, the next step is was to select, you know, the right uh, cobot and to select the right uh, system uh, for this redesigned process. So uh, together with 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 Jacek with Vam, Vam Technik, uh, we start to work on that and taking under consideration all of requir requirements what they have, uh, especially uh, high flexibility. Uh, reduce, you know, some unnecessary steps. Uh, we uh, consider, you know, to use vision system. Why vision system? Because it was uh, very important, you know, to support, uh, to take battery from original cartoon box, exactly what, how they come from, from, from the vendors. Uh, so, so uh, of course, these kind of boxes, cartoon boxes are not tight, so these, uh, these battery cells can can be leave it you know in in in, in uh, uh, several positions so vision system is necessary you know to detect and you know to to control you know the cobot uh, in this case uh, in proper way uh, it's it's also uh, important that system need to be able to control uh, measuring devices because in this process, when after Cobot uh, take out you know, the battery from the carton box, um, carton box, it will put into um, measurement devices to check uh, the voltage and the resistance of the, of the battery cell. So although this part need to be controlled by our system, uh, then in the next step, uh, you know, these cells need to be put into, into the cell holder in the set pattern. Uh, it could be different for different uh, battery packs. And uh, also, you know, the pressing force need to be uh, carefully controlled because it depends on that. You know, it, 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 uh, the quality of the final product depends also on this. Uh, of course, these kind of things like a tact, uh, maintaining tact is, is important. And uh, last but not least, in secure operation uh, together with operator. Because we don't create, you know, the robotic place, the robotic system, but uh, we consider, you know, to just remove, you know, this, uh, uh, let's say, very tough and very difficult to work, you know, for an operator, just uh, replace them with, with with cobot. So it was it was, you know, our requirements. Some others like a fast recognition time. Uh, what is also important is to uh, to system need to uh, recognize the battery polarization. I mean you know, the orientation inside of the carton box, because, because it may happen that at the beginning we, they receive, you know, the carton with uh, wrong polarity. So system need to be 
able to detect this and correct if there is some mistakes, you know, in original carton box. Uh, okay, so uh, finally uh, we propose our system. This is uh, uh, called B Smart Vision. So at the morning, uh, my colleague Paweł Pisaczek, CEO of our company, a little bit uh, introduced, you know, the system. This is our proprietary proprietary uh, system developed, you know, by our engineers. It based on the deep machine learning algorithm. Uh, especially, you know, in this case, convolution filters. <coughs> uh, why, uh, you know, this, uh, why we use this technology? Because it supports, you know, the right resistance against some environmental uh, conditions, for example, changing light conditions, some... Uh, uh, some, let's say, li lightning problem, light, light pro problems, uh, dirt, and so on, and so on. Uh, some additional uh, additional things uh, are uh, important due to requirements of uh, data traceability to support you know the right quality and to prove you know the right quality in case of some customer complaints if it's happened so you know our system reading the QR codes from battery battery cells and assign you know the serial number to the whole battery pack so in this case in the system is visible you know what is inside of uh, what is inside of the battery pack uh, also you know we have you know several data which is collected in our system uh, this is you know some recorded data from measuring devices i mean voltage and resistance uh, we store some images how the battery pack looks like. This is also for a proof process in case if something is wrong. Uh, and uh, uh, we of course print, you know, the mm, mm, with serial numbers. There is a kind of labels, uh, you know, to to to. Uh, mm, uh, sorry, uh, uh, to, uh, to mark, you know, this battery pack, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the Bsmart Vision platform is a cloud-based cloud, uh, solution, which is quite unique. This is quite unique, because uh, typically this kind of system work in, in, in the architecture where the control algorithm and control device like a server or computer typically is we, we can say you know in in house in premises but uh, we have you know different different approach we propose uh, the cloud based solution so in this case you know uh, <laughs> the image from the camera uh, is uh, mm, sent you know to the cloud and you know our algorithm uh, algorithm uh, calculate you know the right position you know for a robot and control you know the robot movement arm, arm movement. Uh, what is you know uh, what is uh, what is uh, benefits uh, on this solution? The first what you can see you know on this image uh, that uh, we can have you know two operation centers or let's say operate, operation team and they can uh, control how it works. So from one side this is you know the engineers in VAM Technik so they can see how the process of assembly how it's going on. But from other side uh, there is uh, engineers uh, in our premises in Attenda where we can uh, control you know how it works. Uh, and especially in case of post training models because of course, we have to learn, you know, our uh, our convolution filters, our ner neural networks. So at the beginning, it's already learned. However, you know, during you know the work, it, we will do some kind of post training, and according, you know, to our uh, experience, uh, it's not enough just leave it as is. It's it's necessary, you know, to control how this post-training process is going on. Uh, 
So in this case, you know, our, our engineers, they have a direct access, you know, to the system and they can control and they can support, you know, the right quality. Besides that, we are able, you know, to check, you know, some parameters of cobot, uh, of uh, drives and so on and so on. And we can do some kind of, uh, in the future, even predictive and preventive maintenance, you know, and to inform that something may be happen, maybe some service is needed, you know, to avoid some uh, uh, unpredictable stops and so on. So, uh, in, 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 in our opinion, you know, this kind of uh, architecture with cloud, this is the future. And, uh, you know, we can imagine, we can come back, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, most of people didn't imagine that their application on the PC, on the computer, they can work in the cloud. Uh, most of people that time think, oh, it's better to have it locally. But right now we use several, several services, which is in the cloud, and we have a lot of benefits. And we believe that this kind of transformation also will happen in, in the industry. Uh, of course, maybe not everywhere, sometimes, you know, the edge controller will be necessary, especially in case if there is a high, uh, uh, high portion of data, maybe, you know, the bad uh, access to the internet. However, uh, step by step, we will have more and more cloud solutions. Uh, okay, mm, other relevant features of the cloud solutions are the uh, fact that everything is maintained by, by a tender in this case. So on the, on the VAM technique side, it's not necessary to have some people who have some programmistic uh, knowledge. It's not necessary, you know, to maintain, you know, some servers and other equipment and other things because everything is on our side. So we, as an IT company, we take care about that. We take care about, you know, uh, correct working without, without any problems. <laughs> uh, we also, you know, offer, you know, this system uh, in the subscription model. Uh, we, we, we call it rent robot as a worker. This is one of the solutions. So, it's not necessary to spend a lot of money, not spend to use CapEx. If cap CapEx is limited, in this case, uh, we can just deliver, you know, these robots and rent it, and it become more like an OPEX model, which is, which is also uh, quite flexible, because in case of, uh, let's say, production stop or something like this, you know, this robot, this, this robot can be sent back uh, and there is no cost anymore. Uh, what is also important, you know, for this application we selected UR, UR uh, Cobot, but of course our system works with many, many different types of robots like Yaskawa, Omron, ABB and so on. Uh, what we use, you know, to uh, decrease the time of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, learning uh, neural networks, uh, we normally use the model 3D model uh, from some CAD system, and we use the engine, uh, the game engine, to generate, you know, thousands of images of the uh, in this case, battery pills, and we do this in the very first, the very, very fast time, much faster than do picture by picture, picture by picture, uh, using camera. In this case, we have kind of synthetic uh, images, and we use these synthetic images, you know, to learn uh, neural networks. So it, it uh, decreases the time necessary, you know, to start, you know, the system. So the process looks: we have a pattern, we do simulation, we do training, and we do validation, and uh, we. We start, you know, the system. Then uh, after that, we have also post training, and we control how it works. If if new uh, details, if new pills, let's say battery battery uh, happen, then in this case we can do some uh, training remotely. Uh, so uh, on this picture, you can see how, how system recognized uh, uh, cells, battery cells. Uh, 
Uh, also, it recognizes, of course, you know, the polarity. In case polarity is wrong due to mistake on the vendor side, then system automatically will correct it. So the robot will just turn, turn uh, 180 degrees, you know, this, uh, this battery cell. And here is a short movie on one of the, uh, this, this is not production, not yet production, but here you can see how it, how it works. It should work, but it doesn't. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some technical issues. Is there any idea? <laughs> Excuse me? No, I don't think so. No, no, on this screen I don't see it. You know, before presentation it worked correctly, you know, this movie, but right now not. So please believe me, it works. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, then uh, of course, you know, every implementation has some issues because life is life. So we can, uh, we, we would like to talk also about some issues, you know, from our perspective, the main issue, it was, you know, some uh, low tolerances and, uh, you know, some, some, some problems, you know, how to, put, you know, the battery, you know, into very tight hole. Uh, there were, you know, some vibrations of, uh, of, of the battery cell, which is happening in case if we want to decrease the tact time and make, you know, the ro uh, cobot uh, movement more dynamically. But uh, uh, these problems, uh, it, it was solved. But there is also some other problem what Jacek, uh, you, you, can, you can highlight, you know, what is visible on this slide. Uh, Michał say a lot of about this problem, but I would like to mention about resources because uh, sometimes we don't have uh, enough competences of resources to provide this kind of project. We are in quite good position because we have a large R&D department, a lot of people, lots of construction, and this is a device. This is a, a device which measuring and rotates um, cells. It's uh, designed by our R&D, our people from R&D. Uh, we used uh, 3D printing technology um, to create functional prototype. Uh, it's a quite uh, good option because uh, cost of and lead cost of this project at lead time it was uh, shorter and lower. Uh, because if we have to waiting for functional model making from, for example, I don't know, aluminium, like a final uh, design, we have to wait for, for example, two months, for example. It's a quite good, uh, long click time, I'm sorry. But if we talk about 3D printing, it's uh, one week and we have functional prototypes. And uh, after this testing, it's still uh, working. Uh, next problem, it was design on station, mm, an optimal station with a focus on optimizing the cobot uh, movements. You see in the right low corner this uh, picture, it's a, a helicopter view on the station. This point, it's a place we uh, where we can uh, assemble uh, cell holders. As you see, this uh, point, it's a lot that we can uh, assemble a lot of shapes of uh, cell holders and boxes. Uh, few sentences about companies. Uh, about Vamtepnik, it was mentioned a few times during uh, this day. Uh, in this year, we finish uh, 30 years old. We have birthday in this in this year, 30 birthday. Uh, we have 30, 60, uh, 260. Uh, employees, uh, f more than 30 person R&D teams. Uh, our turnover in last year, it was 170 millions. And now we have two um, plants in the uh, Piaseczno. Um, some example about uh, which project 
we produce. We are in the medical industry. We are, of course, in the e-mobility and, for example, uh, e-bikes. It's uh, a lot of uh, projects. Yeah, so the last slide is about attending industries, but because it's late, I will not talk too much. You know, our two major product is Be Smart Vision and Be Smart Energy. Uh, but uh, let's let's stay a moment. We will try to show you, you know, this movie from YouTube now. <coughs> Just to let's say correct the problem where we have a few moments ago. <coughs> Please be patient, five seconds, four seconds, yes, thanks Jacek, and now, and now we have it. Okay, so here you can see robot take out you know the battery cell from the original carton box uh, these carton books can be different can be varied different type so a uh, system is designed that you know to work with many different types uh, just works take out you know the battery cell and put you know into this device where we do some electrical checking uh, the, this is, you know, this device is powered by some pneumatics, pneumatics controlled by B Smart Vision, and this system, you know, work like you see. So the mostly vision part is to take out the bat battery from carton box. Uh, in the same time, operator they can do, you know, some other other uh, things. They put, you know, some <laughs> wires with thermistors and some. Uh, heating, uh, heating wires, and so on, and uh, make you know uh, some other steps, you know, in the same time. But you know, the cobot do you know the most, uh, the most monotonous and the most tough, you know, work of the operator. So thank you very much for for your patience. Uh, is there any questions, maybe, about the, about this system and presentation. Okay, if, if there is no question, thank you. And... Uh... Okay, thank you very much. Maybe during the gala dinner it will be a good occasion to talk with uh, gentlemen. Uh, <clears throat> so, because we are uh, uh, a very bit delay, so uh, I want to thank you uh, for the patience, for that you survived this uh, uh, long day. It was a great pleasure, of course, to host you. I am happy that uh, you are here with me at this faculty. And of course, on behalf of the Dean Chmielewski, I want to uh, thank you very much for attendance. And of course, for all persons which watched us uh, today online also, I thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I want to finish the, the first day of the very nice presentations, of course, I am more than sure that uh, we can share this presentation with you if you are interested. So, uh, and the good opportunity, of course, to, to share idea, opinion, discussion will be the gala dinner uh, today at 7 p.m. in the Stare Dom restaurant. So, of course, uh, you are welcome. Uh, and that's it. I think we can finish the, the first day. And of course, I invite you tomorrow in 10 a.m. We will start. And of course, we have much more. Uh, interesting presentation. So thank you very much for today and see you on the gala dinner and see you tomorrow.